Um, calling to order the format meeting for January 2021. Looks like we have a video recording started. I'll call the boards to order going east to west and uh, starting with SDIC. Yeah, I'm going to call the SDIC board to order. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Kenny Staffenson. Danny, you're on mute. I'll move on to Mr. Anderton. Ken Anderton is present. Uh, Tom Hansel is present. Uh, we'll, I'll text uh, Tanny and just see if what's going on. Or Emily, can you reach out to Tanny to see what's going on? Thank you. So we're still waiting for a uh, quorum here until Tanny responds. Great, thank you, Tom. MCDD. Hi, this is Mike Wells, president of MCDD, calling our board to order. And uh, please acknowledge if the other supervisors are here, starting with uh, Nikki Schultz. Nikki Schultz, present. Corky Collier. Corky Collier's here. Uh, Ken Anderton. Ken Anderton's present. And Nancy Hendrickson. Nancy Hendrickson's present. All right, we're all here. Thanks, Thank, thank you, Mike. Pen two. This is Val Humble calling Pen 2 board to order. Uh, I'm present. Mary Helen. I'm pre uh, Mary Helen Kincaid present. Leslie Sawyer. Leslie Sawyer present. Karen, are you here? Karen Myers? I see a phone number, but I don't see your name anywhere. Karen, not present yet. Board is called to order with uh, three uh, board members present. Thank you, Val. Calling the Pen 1 board to order. Emerald Bogue is out today. Claudio Campisano. Claudio Campisano, present. Annalisa Kohler. Annalisa Kohler, present. Jeff Noodleman. Here. Thank you, Jeff. And this is James Allison, I'm present. Pen 1 has a quorum. I think there's something we need to attend to that's not on the agenda. The Pen 1 has not had a formalized secretary since uh, Andy Catugno left the board. Hasn't been a, uh, essential because we haven't had many duties for the secretary, but with the boundary adjustment process completing, we do need a secretary. And um, we I'd like to des designate that person now, um, Annalisa, is it true that you're um, uh, willing and have the time to uh, perf perform those duties? Oh, um, actually, learning more about them, I do in the long run, but not in the very short run. So if someone else could um, take them up in the short run, that would be helpful. But I'm happy to be the long run person. Kelly, can you speak to exactly what we need for the boundary um, hearing? Sure. And really quick, Emily, can you confirm when the next election for Pen 1 will be? Um, that would be in July. Okay. So this would really just be a six month appointment. Um, I am trying to find in the statute, but I believe what we've done in the past, um, just if there isn't somebody who has capacity to take on the secretary role, um, we've done in the past where that's been designated as a staff member. Um, and so I don't know what, if, if Emerald or Jeff may have, um, additional capacity for that day on February 26th, but, um, I believe that we can split the roles to have secretary and treasurer be separate and potentially the secretary role could be, um, a staff member. I don't have any objections to that. Is there, um, if it's just for a single meeting and we, there's precedent for that, um, is are other members of the Pen One board comfortable with that approach? I'm I'm fine, comfortable. Likewise. Okay, as am I. Okay. What was the date of that meeting again? February twenty sixth. 
Okay. So going forward, um, Emily, how do you want to handle um, documenting this decision and who will who from the staff would perform those duties? Yeah, Kelly, can it be you or should it be me? Someone separate from you would be better. It or? would probably it would be better to be somebody separate from me. Um, and so it could be you. Um, I believe in the past it was Janet. I am 100% certain she does not want that role at this moment. <laughs> but yeah, it could be you. Um, it could be Peggy, and then she could delegate it. But um, I, I think it would make a lot of sense for it to be Emily. Yeah. Well, if, if everyone's comfortable, we'll delegate that role um, and keep you informed of who that is. So I think, yeah, we'll just um, put in the record, Kirsten, that like the Pen One board is agreeing to uh, delegate the role to staff at Peggy's discretion. And, and just a, one follow-up question. Will you need additional board members available that day for any reason? I don't believe so. Um, the secretary is delegated most of the um, obligations from the board for this meeting. So they're required to give certain types of information to the commissioners, like the, um, the land to be included and the owners of that land. Um, and I did just find the statutory authority, it's ORS 547.120. Um, and it says that, that the board can elect some suitable person secretary who may or may not be a member of the board. Okay. Um, so, but because in the past we've combined <clears throat> the secretary and treasurer role, it's not appropriate for a staff to be the treasurer. So um, that role would still need to remain with the board. Okay. So it sounds like we're, um, we have what we need and we will elect a secretary going forward in July. Great. Super, thanks folks for um, sitting through that. Uh, I think we can then move on to item B, public testimony. Do we have any public testimony today? So there are a couple of members of the public here from Pen2 and there's going to be some discussion on like some uh, specific items at the close of the joint meeting. And so um, I don't know if anyone, uh, members of the public wanna go ahead and identify themselves now, um, and then we can save that discussion of, uh, about the specific topic of concern for the end of the meeting. But if there's anyone that would like to identify themselves, they could go ahead now. Um, yes, my name is uh, Ernest Gauze. I live 931 Northeast South Shore Road. Um, so uh, this actually is the first uh, meeting I'm actually attending. So one, to understand the context of the public testimony. Is that to bring up issues and concerns? Yeah, definitely any topics. But like I said, aware, because we just, we communicated with you prior to the meeting, I know what your um, questions and concerns are and they're going to be addressed like without the entire group here with just the Pen2 board. And so um, if it's all right with you, we can wait until the end of this meeting so that you can have a more robust discussion with the Pen2 board. Uh, well, no, I, I think it's an issue that should be addressed with the entire board because it may be issues that other property owners who may not be on this call is actually facing. Um, so I don't know if there's a time limit for public testimony, but I rather would address it to the entire board. Is okay, yeah, yes, okay. generally it's um, like a three minutes is the uh, time limit. Okay, well, that's fine. Then I would rather take the three minutes during public testimony. Okay, go ahead. Um, so again, uh, I live at 931 Northeast South Shore Road, and over the last several weeks, not only myself, but a lot of the property owners uh, on uh, Northeast South Shore Road has been experiencing massive flooding. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Emily, I sent you the pictures uh, for you to share with the actual board. The challenge is this, is that there has been an issue that has existed uh, in my neighborhood for probably the last five years that has gone typically unaddressed. And to my understanding is that there's a jurisdictional issue between uh, the city of Portland and the MCDD where finding who is responsible, who is going to actually fix a collapsed pipe um, in my neighborhood. The problem is, is that that collapsed pipe has resulted in massive flooding in my neighborhood. I've reached out to multiple members of the MCDD um, to send them pictures of the flooding. They came out to my home to see the massive flooding. And to be quite honest, that issue isn't addressed. And I'm sure the members of the board have yeah. probably been made aware of this issue, 
But the problem is, is the lack of communication and the lack of response. To date, my property is still flooded. And the answer that I was given was that that's the best we can do. The best you can do to save your property is use sandbags to shore up your property line. Now, I'm sure that if anyone on this call property was flooding, they would probably have a little bit different attitude. But I am the property owner who property is actually flooding. Uh, I had a bridge built in the back of my yard. My bridge floated away, just to sort of put it in context. And I've actually shared pictures of what my property actually looked like. So my question to this board, uh, whether uh, your property is flooding or not, to look at it from the perspective of a property owner whose property is at risk. What I have not heard is a strategy or a short-term plan to resolve the issue. What I have heard is wait till September of 2021 and then your issue will be addressed. So my question to this board and to this group, if your property was at potential risk of flooding today, would you wanna wait nine months? So in speaking to Kareen, as well as speaking to other supervisors, is there, that's what my property looked like before the flood. So as you can see, there was little to no water uh, in the sluice that runs behind my house. As you look at some of these other pictures, you will see how extensive the flooding has become. That is a bridge that literally I had spanning my property and picture number one, it has now floated to the other side of my property. That is my backyard. So imagine going from no water to this is your backyard. And this water has reached all the way to where the foundation of my home is. So my issue is this, is that there is no plan, there is no strategy other than, and that's what it exists like today. I had to literally mm -hmm. climb in the creek and drag this bridge back into place. That is what I'm faced with. And that there hasn't been a plan, there hasn't been a strategy for all of the individuals who live in my neighborhood to pump out this water. What was originally was supposed to happen was there was a sump pump put in to drain some of the water. That pump has now been removed. And what we were told as property owners is, is that there's too much sediment in the pump. Well, you know, if you drain in a creek, you're gonna have sediment in the pump. So when I asked, was it 5% sediment? Was it 10% sediment? It was, I don't know. When I said, what is the strategy to get the remainder of the water out so we don't deal with increased risk during the rainy season is the best we can tell you is get sandbags. So if I told every property owner on this call is that the best that the MCD is gonna do for you is get sandbags and try to protect your own property, everybody on this call would find that answer insufficient. So whether your property is flooding or not, look at it from the perspective of homeowners who line this creek and there has been no relief. This is what we're dealing with right now. And you see in the original picture, there was next to no water and we're in the rainy season. So my question to this group is, what is the strategy and what is the plan to get property owners relief when their property is on the verge of flooding? I am hoping that's a little bit more than get sandbags. Now, when I asked them, did you reach out to the city? Was there any coordination? Do they have a better pump to help get the property owner some relief and uh, remove some more of this additional water? Got no answer, don't know. Don't know if that conversation took place. Gotta talk to my supervisor. There is no ownership in giving any property owner any relief. There is no answers. There is no specificity. Communication is lackluster at best. Now, this isn't your property, I understand that, but I am a property owner who uh, looks to protect their property. And the expectation is, is there is some relief that is provided by this board, or at least a solution other than to tell me I'll deliver sandbags to your house and the rest is up to you. Because at the end of the day, if that's gonna be the position, then I can fill it in with dirt and build a dam on each side of my property and never have to worry about it again. And if that is the position of the MCCD board, then just tell me I'm on my own. And then I can figure it out myself. 
but don't offer a partial solution that doesn't resolve the problem. Thank you for your time. Good prayer. Um, thank you, Ernest, for your um, testimony. Uh, appreciate that. This is about humble. Can I just make a comment? As uh, chair of the board of Penn 2, in which district uh, uh, South Shore is, we do recognize that the uh, property owners there have a problem there. And we have been uh, quest uh, dealing with this question in the past. It mostly does come down to a question of ownership. Does the drainage district, in fact, have control of that waterway and, any, and, the, and the waterways that would drain it? So uh, it, it is an ownership issue, and uh, we are looking at it. We do understand and see the, the draining. I've been up there and, and looked at it myself. Thank you. Uh, can I respond to that question? You know, so as I said, we're going to go into this issue at, in, at depth at, at the end of the meeting with uh, the Penn 2 board. And so if uh, the other district boards would like to participate in this conversation, we could continue this topic now. Otherwise, we have this on the agenda for later in the meeting. And I think that they'll be able to be a more robust discussion uh, once the other boards are able to get through their business. Great. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like we'll move on to agenda item C, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers feasibility study. Evan? James, can I interject and just, uh, I think we can call Tanny Staffenson. Uh, are you present, Tanny? Yes, thank you. Uh, SDSC is called to order and, and quorum. Great. Thank you, Tom. And can I just make one comment? Um, if we can ask um, Ernest, I, I don't have his last name, um, to stay for that discussion because he has some very valid points that could add to that. Um, or if not, um, have him come back. Um, um, because I'd like, I, as many staff people know, I've been trying to address this issue and I don't think I want to take up a prevails and stop. So if Ernest is agreeable to stay through the meeting or um, wait, uh, I, I would really appreciate that. And we should be clear on what time we estimate that to be, that that discussion will be, I think, at about 1.15, I think. I think it's 1.15. Yes, and um, we knew, we anticipated landowners coming for this part, for that discussion, and so they've uh, received the agenda, and, and so anyone else who wants to participate in that discussion should is aware of the timing. This is Val Humble again. I'd like to have the minutes note that um, uh, Karen Myers has joined the meeting, so all four uh, Ten two board members are present presently. Would you identify you. yourself, Karen? Confirm that. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Thank you. And James, sorry, one more thing to interject. Uh, Kelly asked if we could just go ahead and formally have the Pen One board just designate, uh, like, authorize Peggy to designate a staff member as secretary of Pen One. If you could just go ahead and do a roll call just to get that on the record, that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, can I just go ahead and move move to have the um, MCDD designate on behalf of the Pen One Board a secretary to participate in the um, any proceedings re related to the boundary uh, boundary adjustment process and project? Um, I'll, I'll do a roll call. Or I'll okay. second the motion. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's see. Emerald is out. Claudio. Good eye. Annalisa. Aye. Jeff? Aye. This is James. I vote aye. Passes. Thank you. All right, Evan, we, we're ready for you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm Evan Mitchell. I, um, we actually, as since this, we're adding lots of things today, we wanted to uh, quickly, before we get into our plan discussion, around the feasibility study, we wanted to provide an update on a discussion that happened around the feasibility study um, during the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District Board meeting on Tuesday. Uh, so I am gonna turn it over to Corky to provide an update since he is a board member there, but James and Mary Helen, please feel free to add additional insight or thoughts um, after Corky provides his update. As well um, as Danny. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Tanny. Or, or feel free to interrupt me too, especially when I get it wrong. 
Um, so the feasibility study conversation, you know, uh, there was an update on that. I, the conversation quickly shifted to one topic in, specifically, which was um, uh, an irritation with the Army Corps of Engineers lack of action on environmental improvement and uh, environmental justice. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that there was general support at the urban district for moving forward on the Army Corps um, uh, actions uh, in the direction that they're going. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of discussion about that, uh, about it, you know, environmental improvement, which the Corps says it's really not in their, it's not part of their plan. It's not in their purview. Um, and there's some disagreement by some people on that. Um, the concern, I think, is that uh, during this discussion, a comparison was made with the Rose Quarter uh, transportation project on I-5. I'm, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that, but basically it's a project that's been going on for many years to improve that bottleneck on I-5 right in the Rose Quarter area. And it, it has, in the past few months, uh, basically collapsed uh, because of um, demands from the environmental community uh, about that project. Uh, and so there was a comparison made that that could happen here too. Um, so, and I think that's, you know, it's something for us to all keep in mind as we start moving forward toward a geo bond vote. Uh, we don't want to have the community divided with part of the community saying, oh, don't vote for that geo bond because they haven't done enough for environmental improvement or environmental justice. Um, so, that was basically the conversation was, um, you know, how do we move forward uh, as how does the urban district move forward uh, to address those concerns, uh, regardless of whether the core can do anything about it or whether the core is willing to do anything about it? What are we as a community willing to do about it? And I think that's a, a conversation that we need to uh, really dive into, uh, particularly at the urban district. Um, and it's something we need to, to come up with an answer to pretty quickly is what are we going to do before we go to the voters to ask for a GO bond? Um, I hope that's not too vague. Does that describe it reasonably well? well that's a good summary, Corky. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree. You are um, much more politically correct than I would have been, but I think that. Um, the point being is, is and I, I'm the one that brought up, I, I don't want this process to fail because we didn't cover all our bases. Um, and so how your summation that we need to clearly state how we're gonna address those environmental concerns, because uh, it, to me, it's it now becoming more clear. It's, it's a basis of process. Um, if U.S. Army Corps of Engineers clearly stated that's not going to be a part of their purview from the beginning, how are we going to address the concerns of a group of people that want it to be? Um, the issue for them should be to change the Army Corps of Engineers and work with us on however else we address that. So I think how we communicate that clearly will clear up those people that say, oh, they're not doing it right. Um, if they know why they're not doing it, then it will be easier to move beyond. I agree. That's well said, Mary Helen, the notion of, of process and bringing people along. I think what, what the interim board, um, I think, can hope for and expect, and we would be connected to this, would be some sort of um, matrix or translation between what the community, um, what various community organizations want what can be satisfied by the uh, core project, given that we're largely in agreement with what with what the core wants to do, and then how the new agency, given its um, state authorization, what its um, what its intentions are, what the new district can do. Um, but even that that needs to be a process, as Mary Helen said, because e just because something is allowable by statute there needs to be agreement on those because ever, someone's gonna have to pay for that, right? Someone's gonna have to pay for those services. So I think it's, the devil will be in the details. Um, what I think we can all do is just keep our ear to the ground and make sure that um, the process is moving forward because we are, I believe, united in this effort to obtain flood protection and 
um, stand, and then also help the new district district stand itself up um, within the limits of the statue um, and a full full participation in the light of day. And, and James, I think you nailed it right in the head there. It really does come down to who's going to pay for it, I think, because the new district clearly has a mandate to consider environmental improvement and environmental justice uh, as we move forward. And in the past, that has not been part uh, of what we were able to do, really, in these districts. So as we hand things off to the new district, that becomes a bigger issue. And nobody's arguing against that. Uh, the question, I think, really is, well, how do we do that? Who pays for it? And there's a desire for the core to pay for it. I don't think that's gonna be successful, but maybe we can lobby the federal government in the, we're in the Water Resources Development Act, the Word of Bill, uh, to, pay, to pay for part of it. Um, so that's a possibility. And there's also the possibility that we as a local community, uh, that our new taxpayers, the, the most of the residents of Multnomah County pay for it. Um, so uh, there's a few different avenues there. And the most important thing I think for us, in the conversation I think went this direction is that we need to honestly address these concerns, you know, um, and really sit down and figure out what are the be best paths toward finding that money. And I, I would just add the fact that, um, uh, that it hasn't been the mandate of the existing districts. The beauty of standing up this new district is that the, the generic approach to some of these issues would be, approach, would be addressed in the mission vision values, which is their next step of the process. And then there will also be a environmental and um, social equity committee set up which will also have an opportunity to start um, start putting pen to paper of what you're really trying to accomplish. And then those issues can then be folded in to the revenue model and have the public be able to respond on what they're willing to pay and what they're not willing to pay for. And that that is a process, but I think laying out that pathway is is a critical piece of this process. So the voices that want to be heard, get heard. Great. James, did you want to add anything? No, thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for um, that discussion. Obviously it's something that we'll need to continue to talk about. Um, it's certainly at a staff level, something that we talk about a lot as part of our efforts to make the levy ready Columbia work the what the new what the new district is doing and what we currently do all fit together and tell a story to the community um, I don't think anyone has been under under the impression that environmental benefits equity environmental justice aren't items that we need to address and that we need to think about um, it's just making them fit in the right place and ensuring that our stakeholders understand um, and feel a part of and heard during that process. So with that, I am going to share my screen and take us into the feasibility study. Um, this is our final meeting before, uh, well, hypothetically, we could add more meetings if you wanted, but this is currently the plan for our um, final meeting before we ask the boards to vote on the draft resolution and letter of intent that you had in your packet. And so we wanted to um, quickly run through and talk about some, you know, the cost components of these projects, uh, make sure that everyone's grounded in that information, and then open it up for discussion about the resolution or any other um, issues that are that are um, still hanging out there that are on your mind. So just really quickly to, to remind folks of what we've been working through your requests for information over the last uh, six to eight months. Um, so we've talked about the potential timelines, including off ramps, really using the best case scenario of a word of 2022 authorization uh, to illustrate what the process looks like um, 
trying to communicate that that could be bumped back by a number of years, depending on what happens with WERDA, depending on whether or not we're included in the initial WERDA that we go after. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty there, uh, and it could be more than two years before we are able to, to get the project authorized. Um, we talked about the self-certification of funding, which is the form that, that goes in with the letter of intent. Uh, Mark provided some information on the number of sites with risks of unidentified contaminants. We've talked about project cost estimates and budget and cash flow needs, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more today just to, to close the loop on that. And then with the individual boards this month, we talked about potential options to secure the 35% match, and um, we'll touch on that again today. Uh, so as I've mentioned, we're going to hit on the total project costs, uh, potential cash flow needs, we want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to actually see the final report if you want to review it. It is quite lengthy and in depth. The main report itself is 324 pages, and then each appendix is a couple of hundred pages. Um, but we do want to, you know, we've, we've crafted a short summary so you know what each section of the report is. And if you want to review any of it, um, we, we can share some of that. And then we really want to focus in on that draft resolution letter of intent and see where you all are and what you need. Just quick overview. I'm going to hand it off to Mark soon. Um, just a reminder, we're in the first part of a three-phase process. We were authorized for this study in October of 2018. It's a three-year study. Best case is that we get authorized, if we move forward, we get authorized in late 2022, and the the design phase, which they, the core calls pre-construction pre engineering and design, would happen in a two-year period, and then we get authorized and move into construction um, with however much funding we're able to get. That could come all at once. It could come in fits and drafts. Um, but the best case to begin that would be, um, you know, sometime in 2025. We've talked about a little bit about our local sponsor costs, and we've really been thinking about them in three buckets. Um, the pre-engineering, before the pre-engineering and design phase begins. So that's the work that we do to prepare for PED. Uh, it, then there's the cost during PED, which includes the local match, which is a 35% local match, plus other associated costs that we'll need to think about to here for the construction phase. Then there's the construction phase, which is the local, another 35% match. We get credit for the PED match and then our real estate costs, which we're gonna dig into today. Now I'm, I'm turning it over to Mark to kind of start to dig into those details. Thanks, Evan. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, these slides, some of these slides will look very familiar to you. Um, so some of them I'll go through rather um, quickly and I'll give you opportunities to stop and ask questions. I know that we threw some of these numbers at you previously and some of these things take a little while to sink in. So uh, we definitely appreciate that. And that's why you're seeing them again in the same form. Um, so the, the numbers here um, are, the, are the kind of the big, the big ticket items, um, the phases that Evan spoke to minute ago, um, PED and construction are the big, the two latter buckets. Um, and this graph shows you the local match. Um, and that is the low, when I say local matches by all four districts combined, um, you can see our local match for PED is 3.85 million and construction is uh, 47.6 million. And again, uh, as I alluded to during our individual board meetings, the that interest figure is actually sort of just accounts, it's a core label, but it's really accounts for inflation factors during construction. So you may not see those directly. Those aren't like a cash payment that is, um, that's sort of built in. We expect costs to rise slightly over the three to four year period of construction. Next slide. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, Evan did, speak to that first bucket, the local cost before PED. Um, we spoke to this in um, November, December. Uh, there's a lot of work that's underway. You, you were all probably aware um, last budget cycle, you approved some funds to 
protect our easements. Some of that is, um, all of that is necessary to complete these projects. Um, and ahead of PED, there are, there's work to be done to make sure that our existing uh, operations and maintenance footprint for the existing levees is, um, is up to snuff and is there for our use um, for when we go to construction. So when we get into PED, and just after PED, we'll be looking at um, acquisitions focused strictly on the new footprint in places where the levee prism has to expand or, um, or temporary construction easements for staging and access. Um, also, engaging real estate specialists, we talked about that last time, with such a large um, real estate portfolio, um, we may need to acquire additional help in addition to our um, existing services from uh, Miller Nash uh, to advise on real estate acquisition strategy. Um, City of Portland um, has also mentioned possibly right-of-way specialists that would help with um, putting a plan together. And then utility relocations, as you'll see in a um, few future slides, um, most of our cost share is uh, real estate and relocations and the relocations um, is, uh, is a very large amount. It's a very complicated effort. So um, we'll be making sure that we're ready um, to go down that road when we, when we get into PED and we have a better understanding of our relocations needs. That includes relocating or re reconstructing Marine Drive and Bridgeton Road when the levee is elevated there. Um, that's probably the, it's 90% of our relocation costs. Um, and there's other associated utility costs. Next slide. Um, this slide should look familiar. Um, we talked about this extensively last month. Uh, this is our 35% cost share um, in PED. Uh, that this, this amount will be credited to us during the construction phase. So there's a um, minimum cash contribution that I'll um, speak to, and this is credited towards that. Um, this money doesn't come all at once. As you can see, we kind of metered it out by as to how we expect um, those design costs to come up year to year. And our budget cycle is approved just a couple months before uh, the core's fiscal federal fiscal year. And so we have we have time to raise those funds annually prior to the core ask, uh, sending us an invoice. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, during, during PED, we, we just spoke to our local costs. That's that 3.85 million distributed um, as, as to be determined. Um, there will be real estate preparations. Some of that uh, will be um, in the form of the annual budget requests that you've, you saw last year. Some of that money that um, towards real estate uh, organization um, was, was funded about 90K last year and we expect probably around that same ballpark this year, just continue to make, make steps to clean up our real estate portfolio. Um, we spoke to the potential investigation of environmental contaminants um, really briefly. We had, there was one site that the Corps is interested in um, pursuing phase two environmental investigations just to rule out potential for contamination and to understand um, what could be present in our footprint and if we need to move our footprint a little bit to avoid those contaminants. And we have, um, we've had some ongoing discussions about a strategy to um, do any further investigation or to hold some funds and contingency in the event that um, damages are encountered during construction. And then um, there, there is potential, these are also ongoing conversations about the, the, the delta between what the Corps is mandated to do and what it's um, projected to do through the NEPA process and where the gaps are um, with our local regulatory standards that could be maybe um, a little above and beyond what the core is proposing. And then of course there's continued advocacy in DC as Corky alluded to earlier, to get that word of funding. Okay, next slide. Okay, during construction phase, we, we focused on PED last time, this time we'll talk about construction. Um, this distribution is, is approximate. It's based on the increments of construction that uh, the Corps presented to us. Um, and you'll see that in a, a future slide. This is kind of how we expect the funds to drop out based on the fact that most of our costs are real estate 
uh, acquisition and relocations. And most of that is done prior to the core letting construction contracts. So that's why even though there's four years of construction, um, if, if everything goes as the core plans, uh, the, most of the costs are up front. And that 31 million in that second year is because the uh, Bridgeton Road Marine Drive levy, um, levy raise and road reconstruction, that occurs in a uh, second, I should say a third increment, uh, which starts in that second year. So um, this is again, a conservative ser ser uh, scenario. And most of this is kind of done in phases, which I'll break out in a graph here shortly. Mark, can I ask just a question here, but, or do I need to wait to the end? I, I don't see any mention of the railroad embankment. Railroad embankment is actually included in that first year. I'll, I'll show that to you in the construction schedule in the uh, okay. slides. Okay, uh, the local sponsor costs, again, this breaks down. We have a 35% match on that $129 million. Um, most of that is credited from our real estate lands and relocations, which you can see in this table. So, um, so we don't actually pay that money out in cash to the core, but we do um, pay that as we acquire lands and we complete a relocations effort. So a lot of the relocations, um, a lot of that will come on the back end because in the case of the road raise, you can't complete those relocations until the road is raised and the utility stubs can then be uh, raised and the road repaved and, and all the appurtenances. So, um, but that's, that's where our big costs are. Next slide. And then there is a minimum 5% cash contribution. In this case, like I said, real estate absorbs so much of our 35% match. There is, the core has a 5% cash minimum that's listed right there. We'll get credited 3.85 from PED and that'll be our total cash due during construction. So that'll come in that first year. That's part of that $13 million you saw on the previous slide. Next slide. So here's, here's all the the bits and pieces during construction. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Next slide. And this is the construction schedule I mentioned, uh, Mary Helen. Uh, this is this is the best case layout. And I want to preface this with things things could be stretched out further. Um, it all depends on how uh, how thing, how quickly we get authorized in WERDA, and then within the core how these increments um, are allocated between the. the the funds they receive from Congress, the core still has a prioritization internally as to how um, different things get funded and allocated. And we're competing with things in the Midwest that have seen recent funding. So while we have a lot, of, we have a really good cost benefit ratio, um, there are other areas that have suffered from recent funding and have reconstruction required. So um, it, it's, we'll, we'll see how that works out. The core anticipates after PED, you can see at the end of 2024, They'll give us a list of real estate, um, the exact list of real estate acquisitions, which is primarily easements. Um, and then the beginning of that, we'll sign the, the project partnering agreement and head into that Pen 1 construction phase. We'll start to acquire real estate. And that's where the, the first money drops that I, I pointed out for $13 million. Um, shortly after that, so they'll have done most of the design um, for, for that first increment in Pen 1. During PED, and they'll they'll get to get to moving on uh, moving dirt pretty quickly. Um, they'll also start on the second increment, which is all the work in MCDD, the Peninsula Drainage Canal, this SDIC pump station, all the other pump station work. Um, they'll get started, kind of touching up the designs on that, and then they'll award that construction contract. And so that's why those you can see why those two first years have so much money going out the door, all the real estate and relocations required to implement those, and then. Um, the final increment will be the Peng 2 construction, which is Marine Drive, Bridgeton Road raise, and um, that'll occur much further. But that's, um, that's kind of the, the general layout and the sequence. And this can be altered um, by circumstances that are unforeseen right now, but this is what the Corps is proposing currently. Next slide. Mark, before we move, this is Jeff. Sure. Or oh, maybe, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you're just forgetting there. I thought you you threw out a number for um, for acquisitions. Um, and I, it, I, all I heard was million. Um, 
So it, do you have that number or is there such a thing? For real estate at lands and relocations acquisitions? Yeah, that's, that is this slide right here. So that's $13 million in lands. Again, that is 90, 90 uh, easements. Um, and, and there's very little fee title built into that $13 million figure. Uh, yeah. And, um, and I do want to point out some of those are public lands. So there is a possibility to negotiate with some of our partners on actual easement costs. Um, and some of those partners are ingrained in, in our whole effort and, and uh, there, are, there are maybe incentives for, for them to participate. And um, we, in the, in, uh, it's also important to mention that uh, we still get credit for that fair market value that the core has appraised these properties at. So if our local partners decide to help defray the costs by offering us those easements at a lower cost, we still, as a collective partnership, get credit for that amount. So that's very, I think that's a very important point to raise. And then that $28 million relocations, that is 90% of that is in pen two at the, um, with the, the levy raise there and all the reconstruction afterwards. Um, the other 10% is uh, things like uh, the Pen One, uh, the Heron Lakes Golf Course relocations, um, kind of uh, re restoring that and readjusting that, and um, and some of the other minor minor relocations. Thank you. Sorry to sorry to pull you ahead, but before I just I just heard a, a word millions, and so I appreciate the uh, the great explanation. Thank you. Perfect. Mark, just a quick question. Sure. So. Army Corps projects do not require a NEPA phase. The, the Army Corps, actually, you'll see the um, the study. <clears throat> if you if you ask to see the, the report document, is actually an integrated feasibility study and environmental assessment. And that environmental assessment is uh, is their NEPA process. So currently, there's been determined to be no significant impact from uh, from the work being done. And so they're not required to go to the EIS process, which is much more extensive. Um, when we go into construction, they'll have to resubmit a supplemental and sort of sort of verifies, yes, we're still finding no significant impact and we still aren't subject to an EIS process. Um, and, and because of the work they've done to stay out of waterways, uh, stay sort of within the existing footprint as much as possible, uh, reduce impacts, they're, they're making the case for, for the EA process under NEPA instead of the EIS. Thank you. You're welcome, Tom. Okay. Um, Quick question. Uh, you may have answered this before. Like I said, this is my first meeting. From a property owner perspective, is this a bond issue, a levy? Is it a ballot issue? What, uh, what portion of this is the property owners are going to have to pay? That's a good question, Ernest. I'm going to defer that to Colin because we are actually talking about um, how we're going to allocate these costs towards the end of this presentation, if that's all right. No, that's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, um, Mark, I'd like it if you could go back one slide, please. I wanted to make one comment. One thing I just want everybody's attention brought to is you see that dark line, the vertical line in the middle of 2025. And that is a projection of when that permanent district comes into play, the permanent Irma district. It may happen sooner, um, but we have kind of put it at that place. So there's a recognition that if we, so if I want people to be fully aware that if there is a desire for helping fund some of this um, through a geo bond or through the new urban district. It's really, some of this is gonna be, there's a little wiggle room in here around 2025 if this gets, if this process goes through lickety split as, um, as it's outlined up here. Thanks, Peggy. An important point. Um, okay. This can I just. This is Nancy. Uh, thank you, Peggy, for bringing that up. And I just wanted to remind everybody that this is exactly why we formed the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District is so that there would be um, a wide base to pay for regional benefits. 
Thanks. To me, to me, it's nothing more. It's just a timing issue that we have to. We go in with our eyes wide open. Yeah, this, there, there are gonna, there's some moving targets here, um, and it's important that we're all aware of how those things could affect these. But we've put together these estimates, the best possible awareness of the current scenario, the proposed scenario. Um, if you can move forward to our cash flow needs, this, this sort of uh, compresses those two timelines that you saw earlier. You can see the PED funding up front there, and then in 24-25, Kind of lead into those real estate requirements for the first phase, actually for the first two phases of con, uh, construction. Um, there, the thirteen point eight three million. Uh, the the two smaller values at the very end; those are that estimated interest from those years. Um, I alluded to earlier that really just sort of CPI increases. So we may not have a cash payment per se coming out. Um, those years that may be built into our relocations contract or the core's construction contract. So um, that's what those numbers are. But these are the cumulative amounts of sort of cash flow going out the door. Um, and you can see everything stacked up in the cumulative total uh, of PED and construction. Um, uh, I think that's, that's where I'm going to hand it off. Yeah, so I, I actually, I'm going to hop in really quickly and just talk a little bit about how we're going to pay for the PED costs. And again, we're, we're predominantly focusing on PED costs right now because that's next. And that is what we see as the drainage district's responsibility, assuming that, you know, the process for the urban flood safety water quality district continues on track and that they're stood up by 2025. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll definitely need to have more discussions with them about costs as we go. So one of the requests that you all made was around securing, um, you know, how are we going to raise this 35% match? And we, could, we can't give you an exact plan yet because there is, there are so many different factors. Once we, you know, now that we have the preferred plan, we know what the details of the study, you know, kind of the, the final recommended plan are there's a lot of opportunity to start talking about how we raise some of these funds as we talked about in individual board members some of you hinted at could we add it to assessments and um, the answer is yes we could look at ways to do that one of the things that we'll need to figure out as we move forward is how we're going to allocate these costs because there's four districts and the core only gave us one set of numbers so we could allocate them in a number of different ways, which we started to dig into at your individual board meetings. And we'll definitely need to continue to be in discussion as we move forward. We also can negotiate some in-kind service credits with the core. So whether that's MCBD staff providing services, MCBD contracting to provide services, or negotiating with our partners to, to, to take advantage of opportunities um, you know, where they have equipment or staff expertise that could help us. Uh, the core has been reluctant so far to be willing to say there's going to be much of that opportunity during PED, but from what we've heard from other sponsors, um, there, there is some wiggle room there and, and we'll have an opportunity to do some of that negotiating as we create our design agreement after authorization. We definitely, you know, we'll need to talk to our partner agencies in particular about potentials for contributions, both on the in-kind side and um, in cash. Uh, and then there are a number of state and private grants that we can apply for, as well as loans that we could consider looking at. So those are some of the big buckets of ways that we've thought about how we could potentially fund the 3.85 for PED. Oops, there we go. So two other things, and then we're going to just open it up for discussion about um, the resolution and kind of where we are. So the full report, which is still very much in draft, you know, it's a draft form. It has not been um, authorized through the core's um, chain of command, and um, we've received it as the local sponsor. It is not a public document by any means, but we do want to make it available to you all. 
if you would like to read um, any specific part of it, there is the main report, which I talked about earlier, it's about 350 pages. That covers all of the you know, study objectives, the study area, the process that was used, um, the findings, and the, the alternatives that were looked at, the recommended plan. It is kind of the best overall summary of um, the work that was done and the findings. And if there was anything that, that you wanted to look at within this report, that would really be the section that we as staff would point to. Um, we, so basically, all you need to do is email me the request. We'll send you a specific link. It will only be for you if you forward it on to other people, it will not work. Um, and this is just because we're trying to, to be good partners to the core who have asked us to keep this as confidential and, and tightly under wraps as possible. The other thing which was included in your memo um, is, you know, as a staff, we've talked a lot about this and um, we really, we believe that it makes sense at this time to continue to support the feasibility study. It remains the most viable way to get federal funding for levies. There are not really that many other paths that we could pursue unless earmarks come back or you know there's a dramatic change in, uh, under the new administration. Um, you know, the, the, the Fiscal impact for you all in the next fiscal year is relatively small. Um, you know, it's really focused on perfecting the existing easements for our current footprint, which is work that we need to do regardless to make sure that we've shored up our existing easements. Uh, it's positive that it includes some of the, the FEMA certification projects, even though that was not their objective. Uh, Mary Helen earlier pointed to the railroad embankment. You know, this this they put a solution forward for some of the most complicated and expensive challenges in the system that we've struggled as a community to uh, find solutions for. We also, um, you know, recognize that there's time to continue to have this discussion and there are off ramps for the boards. Should you, you know, continue to evaluate, continue to look at benefits and risks and decide that, that you don't want to continue to move forward. We just, don't think that it's worth getting off the train yet while we're in but you know we're in line right now for federal funding with limited cost to us so it, it makes sense to us to continue to support the study for the time being um you know in terms of what comes next the thing i really want to point out um is you know we've been building up to this decision voting on the resolution to allow the ED to sign the letter of intent and certification of financial feasibility, which we've talked about over the last five months. Um, you know, co going forward, what we plan to bring you is some more specifics, both around the, the budget request for the feasibility study related work for this coming fiscal year, and then um, also kind of our schedule of what discussions we have, what work we do to continue to evaluate our risks and benefits, and also policy decisions that will need to be made prior to PED. So our hope is to bring that to you in March. Uh, with that, I want to open it up to hear what you all are thinking. Um, you received a resolution and letter of intent in your packet. So, you know, we definitely would love to hear what your thoughts are and where you are, especially, you know, changes that you'd like to see, issues that you'd like addressed, or any questions you have. Um, I have a couple questions, just in light of the conversations this week. Um, and in, I'm far enough away that you can't throw something at me. But if it's possible to address what seemed to be the biggest concern um, from one of the uh, interim board members was uh, that their concerns had not been addressed. Um, and I've already heard in two short days, nobody's listening to it. You know, I wrote a letter and I was concerned about this, uh, the blue hair at uh, the hair and rookery at Blue Heron Golf Course is a big concern to a number of people um, and how that's going to affect them playing golf. Um, I know Casey plays there, so maybe he hears things. But I, I think 
we need to substantiate why we're saying this is a good thing as opposed to they told me so. Um, you know, we've done all the study. Uh, this is the best, best path forward. Yes, we're going to address environmental concerns in whatever way it can be stated. But more importantly, have an opportunity for those people to do an online Zoom meeting and tell you their concerns. And then you can say the same thing about the Pen 2 residents because the uh, Corps was very good about going out and doing tours. I think Val was on both or there was three, I believe, because they also went to a Bridgeton neighborhood meeting. Um, but I feel pretty strongly about in order to say this is the best path forward, we have to address those people that we already know um, are going to come forward and say, you didn't talk to us. And there were some, what, 48 letters that were quoted as being submitted. And um, I know it's a concerted effort. And I know the Audubon Society is um, strongly concerned about environmental um, justice. Um, and I, I would just like to be able to state clearly that, yes, they were and I don't know whether they were, and if they've already been with staff, that's fine with me too. Mary Helen, can we, I, I'm gonna ask, I think a couple of staff to, to follow up a little bit on that. Um, I, yeah, that, that's fine. It could be another time, but that's my main concern. No, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I think that's a really valid concern um, and something that we, thought about and talked a lot about it at a staff level. One of the things we want to be clear with this board, with the, with the drainage district board on is that the core will, so a couple of things, the core will respond to all the letters as a part of the final report. There will be, you know, a sort of thematic cataloging of the issues that they heard and a core response. So but the reason, you know, part of that's part of their process that will be included with the final report, not kind of sent out now before the final report is, is approved and authorized. Um, of course, you know, of course, we want to continue to address that people don't feel like their concerns have been addressed. I, I hope, and my sense has been that we did a pretty good job in Pen 2 of addressing the concerns for the folks who live on the top of the levy. Um, and, you know, while I think there's still some frustration about process, there's not as much angst about the, the actual idea, the concept that's being proposed. And last I heard that there was even, you know, potential talk of, you know, how could the community build on this and make it better with sidewalks and other, um, you know, kind of looking at that as an opportunity to do some additional stuff at the local level. I, I agree that that part was good, but what I'm hearing is, well, they're listening to Penn too. Why aren't they listening to us? And that's going to be thrown out there like confetti. And, and Mary Helen, this is Peggy. Um, we have been, developing a strategy to address that following that meeting on Tuesday, recognizing we need to face, we need to address this so people feel that they are heard and, and understand what can be done, what can't be done by the, by the core, and then again, circle back on the issues that could possibly be addressed, not through the feasibility study, but through that new urban district. I think that conversation has to circle back around. Are there other? This is Val Humble. I have a, a concern about the letter that uh, Peggy is going to uh, send to the, to the Army Corps uh, reaffirming our support of the project and everything. I noticed that the uh, putative uh, draft has a March placeholder date on it. Something in the materials we saw last month indicated that the Corps asked for that letter by the end of February. So I, I hope we are on the same page with the Corps about whether they want that by the end of February versus in March. 
The core asks us to make the decision in February. We can provide them with the materials in March. They just have to have the full package of everything assembled by the end of March to send on April 3rd. So we're, 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 we're coordinating them with them really closely. And if there has, I, I've noticed that as well. There's been a little bit of jumping back and forth between February and March. And that's because They've asked us to make the decision and- that, That's good. We don't need a, uh, all the details. If, if it's been attended to, that's fine. Yes. The discrepancies have been addressed. Evan. I just, I, I actually raised this question to Peggy the other day. Uh, this is pertaining to exhibit B. Uh, there is a, an additional red line in there that identifies um, we're basically obligating a, another board for financial capabilities. So my question was, and, and I know Hong and Colin and Peggy responded, but it's just good for the group to hear the question. I, I question if, if we have the authority to uh, condition another board to their financial capabilities. So. And Hong, are you on? Because I'd rather have a legal response than. Yeah, yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you, Tom, for that very keen analysis. Um, so the purpose of uh, us adding the red line, and if I may share my screen, um, Evan, I would appreciate that, um, is so that I want to make sure that we can say that we have financial capability um, and certainly with the construction costs, we wouldn't. And, and to Nancy Hendrickson's point earlier, that's why we created the, the new entity. So it was more of a forward looking qualifier, but um, host disabled. So I don't know how I can share my screen. If somebody it's, can allow it's me the to term, share my It's the term, we, they will. Yeah. I, we've conditioned them. Yeah. Um, so in fact, I, I followed up with the core attorney and his position is um, don't even add that qualifier in the form language itself. But he said you can um, have uh, add whatever clarification you want as an attachment. So if I may share my screen, I'll just take this opportunity to ask this board to consider a slight uh, amendment uh, to the language in the resolution in Exhibit B, if I may. So um, may I have an ability to share, share my screen. Emily or um, anybody else who's a host, can you? I got you, just one second. Um, again, they don't want any change to the form language because that will you know, slow down the review process, but they're, they're open and considerate of our desire to provide the clarification we need uh, based on our our uh, statutory ability. So here I go. Oh my world. Can you see that already? No. Okay. There you go. I think it's Can you started. see my screen? It's starting. There you go. All right, so um, yep. this the, on this side, it's the um, original exhibit B with the proposal. Um, my recommendation is that we just strike the proposed additional language. Um, and, and Tom, I'll get to your concern shortly here and just submit the form language, but then um, per the core's lawyer's uh, response, he's fine with us adding a clarifying attachment to this certification. And what I've, at, what I've proposed that we say to them is that the attachment clarifies the financial capability to satisfy the non-sponsor's obligation um, of this project through their authorizing statute. And Tom, this is your language. Um, and I'm gonna reference ORS 547 and 554 and through their successor entity under ORS 550. Will that be satisfactory, Tom? Because th this is a great vehicle. This is the vehicle I think we could do this for the kind of changes. I, I like, thank you for listening. You know, I'm, 
I'm in government. I look at these things and it's it just when we were identifying another board will that set flags off. So, yeah, well, it's and that's yeah, uh, I, I understand. But, you know, that that is sort of the uh, under the statutory succession um, a merger of uh, five or 550, they're going to take what we take on anyway, but I understand the point. So if if this board is okay uh, with this proposal, um, then part of the, when we get to the deliberation and decision making process, um, I'll ask for this amendment to exhibit B and um, request that we attach the clarifying attachment to exhibit B. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And in a way, as as it's self-standing like that, it really calls attention to it, as opposed to to kind of being buried in the text of the language. Correct. Good job. Thank you. Um, I had a I had an, an additional question. Is that um, in the presentation at the very end, it talked about for the approval of the resolution and the letter of intent. And so I'm assuming this sort of goes into the next phase of the discussion, which is the approval of the resolution and uh, the certain development review standards and fee schedule. So my question is, in talking about the fee schedule, is that how the project is going to be paid for? Is that the structure of the actual payments? Uh, and maybe you guys have discussed this before, but the fee schedule means what exactly? The second question I would have is the letter of intent. So the letter of intent means that you guys intend to move forward, but you're intending to move forward on something that you haven't defined how you're going to pay for it yet. So I guess my question is, and, and maybe I misunderstand the last slide where it said letter of intent. Yeah. So Ernest, the you're I think you're um, um, talking about two different items um, okay. of the and discussion that's here. Is that yeah. How, so maybe, maybe this is totally different. Yeah, the fee schedule is related to the de development review program, which is um, up um, after this agenda item. Uh, with respect to the feasibility study and um, the, the, the planning for that and the construction and the funding, um, this we're following a federal, pre federal project process with the Army Corps of Engineer and that's, um, and that's the process to which we are, are bound within in order to try to get federal funding to help us with the construction on more of these uh, flood control projects, large flood control projects. Okay, and so uh, a quick question would be that if you fail to get federal funding, does the letter of intent bind the homeowners to therefore default to paying for the project? It may not, I'm just asking the question. Uh, I, uh, I am confident that uh, the, the deliberation by this group will be that it will be discretionary and it will not be binding on, on, the, on the district. Want to do a quick time check for everyone? We're we're just about at the end of this uh, agenda item. We have a sense for how much longer we are going to continue this discussion before moving on. Yeah. Um, if there's any other uh, topics, questions, items that folks want to raise, if not, I think we can pass it off. Or you're welcome to, you know. Uh, help you know talk to Peggy and she'll make sure that the rest of us are aware of your concerns so we can work on addressing them and Ernest I also wanted to offer that if you want to have a discussion about this project on the slide we'd be happy to brief you on on why we're pursuing the feasibility study and kind of the background on that great uh, thank you Evan I think I'm going to move us on unless there are objections since we're not at a, at a decision point right now uh, I just want to thank you to the um, staff, um, Evan, Mark, and Hong. Nice job as always. Um, thank you. So let's go ahead and move on to item E on the agenda. Bill's going to talk about assets and liabilities. Actually, I think I think we're on item D, development review. Yeah. Glad someone's keeping an eye on me. Uh, item yeah, D. Don't let us miss out on that fun. Good grief. <laughs> That's a lot of time in that resolution, James. <laughs> Okay. Clearly, I've been at my desk too long here. Okay, so um, item D, development review update, Bill? Uh, yes, um, good, welcome out of time. Good afternoon, all. Um, thank you for um, setting aside some time to talk about this topic and the next one. 
Um, the first topic here is about development review program. This is um, a proposal that this, these boards saw um, a, a couple months ago. Uh, looks like now it's, it was back in August. Um, and since then, um, we, uh, we've honestly just been trying to find time in your uh, busy agenda schedule, um, board schedule um, to, uh, to circle back with you. So um, the materials that are part of the development review program changes uh, are in your meeting packet. Hopefully you have a chance to glance to those ahead of time. Um, the recommendations have not changed uh, since the August uh, meeting, um, but let me go over those just very quickly. Um, there was a proposal and is a proposal to change the technical standard for the levy um, to make sure there's uh, adequate clearance of any overhead lines um, that um, uh, that are installed, new overhead lines, not existing, uh, new overhead lines that are installed over the levy system. And we we're proposing to have a minimum uh, clearance of 35 feet. Um, I believe um, uh, Ken had suggested we reach uh, out to um, the utilities just to um, kind of truth check uh, that uh, proposal. Uh, I was able to, get to contact and have a, a somewhat lengthy discussion with PGE um, and they were comfortable with that 35 feet. It's akin to a clearance they already do for railroads. Um, and so the, it's, it's already in their process. So, um, uh, so um, I was comforted with that uh, that response. Um, I wasn't able to um, um, to um, get final confirmation from uh, Pacific Power, um, but uh, the, those um, those clearances are not um, just for one utility. I'm sure those clearances are safety related and uh, affect um, you know, multiple utilities. Um, so I'm I'm comfortable with that technical standard. Um, the administrative costs uh, and the cost uh, changes that are proposed uh, haven't changed. There's no change for tier one. Um, we're increasing the base fee value by uh, $160 um, to cover um, costs that we've been tracking over time and, and noted that the, the $550 original estimate was too small to um, recoup the costs that we uh, in that we incur on average for those that tier two level. Um, the biggest change probably is the um, a, a shift away from a monthly invoice approach to a flat fee for um, the tier two uh, work. And that was, um, that would change from a ceiling of $2,500 to a flat fee of $1,500 and $1,510. And um, in the, and um, th at the tier three level, there there is no change in costs. Um, we did um, add a um, uh, some unit costs for um, construction inspection um, that was also in the um, in your materials, uh, as well uh, as updating our hourly rates uh, as staff, and since they have not been updated since 2018. So um, that is the long and short of the proposal again, um, and the resolution I believe is in your packet. Um, and um, I'm open to, it's resolution number 2021-0101. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions you might have um, and before uh, you consider that re resolution. This is Bob Humble. Uh I'd like to point out there's a logical uh, problem with the implementation date given in the resolution. Uh, it may be moot in this particular one if we deal with it today, but you say it will be implemented on February 1st or 30 days after approval, whichever comes first. And you certainly mean whichever comes later, otherwise you could be implementing it before it's approved. Long, um, would you like to? Yeah, I think I think Val, I think that's again very keen reading by you, but I think the intent is we're going to try to get it implemented by by February first. It was drafted at a time where we wasn't sure we weren't sure if we can get it passed by February first, but if we could, that we're we're ready to go with that implementation. I understand practically, yes, but just in the future one, 
you don't want to have a statement that is going to be implemented before it's been approved. And that is a possibility under the current phrasing. Oh, I see. No, I, I, um, I'm, I, I see your point. It was uh, whichever comes earlier, either February 1st or 30 days after the board's approval. But I, I see your point. Thank you. I, I'd comment that uh, Bill did a really nice job on this and thank you for going through it really thoughtfully and and uh, I think the increase is you know, from my perspective as a development professional I think a rational and fit within a framework that's reasonable from my industry's perspective. Um, I had a question and maybe Mike you already answered it but um, I ran this by a couple of development review advisory committee members of the city and they said as um, they thought it looked good but it was yet a, another step and that it was uh, it, dependent on which jurisdiction you know because builders build in many um, if it was cumbersome um, it might be overlooked or you know not be applicable and James Tom um, probably all have comments on that but I just wanted to make sure that we didn't weren't causing more grief for builders and developers. So no, I don't think so, Peggy. Or uh, uh, excuse me, Mary Helen. The well, thanks the, for in the, the compliment. Past, <laughs> in the past, for years and years and years, uh, those of us who do development in that in, in the Columbia Quarter have known that that you need to go see the drainage district and and. Um, What's happened over the last uh, four or five years is it's become a, a little bit more um, formalized, and um, and and so the, the the design professionals and developers can look online now and see what the process is. We've got these different tiers you fall into, uh, and uh, and budget numbers. Whereas before, all you knew is you had to get, you had to get the box checked, but you weren't quite sure how how you're going to do it and what was going to cost. So now it's it's straightforward and uh, I, I think much better than it has been in the past. Okay, thanks. Um, and I just wanted to comment on the Amazon project that's on Shamir Road in Pen 2. Um, and so that we adequately cover our costs that it's gonna take to deal with that, so. Right, just for clarification, Mary Helen, this proposal is for um, development reviews that would start after this resolution is approved. So the, the Portland Meadows site is still uh, dependent upon uh, the previous uh, version uh, in addition to conversations the Pen2 board has had on that topic. Okay. Well, and, but, but to be clear, the, they're still subject to the fee, but it's under the previous schedule, which hasn't changed dramatically for that tier, right? Uh, that's correct, and that particular project is fairly large, and so there. And that's correct, right? So it's a tier three project, and in what's proposed here, tier three is not changing. Uh, I know Nancy had her hand up. Thanks. Thanks. Just a couple of things. Um, I think the fees all sound reasonable. In fact, I'm wondering, um, do is there a regular way to up? Date them. You said they haven't been updated in, I guess it's three years now, but do we have a, a proposed schedule of updating them? Or does or does that happen automatically? And this came to the board because you know you went, you changed the structure of it. Yeah, my intent uh, is to um, my intent was to come back to the board after I collected enough data um, to justify uh, any changes. And I needed more than a year updated I felt to do that and so in about two years after this after you initially approved the resolution is uh, when we came to you and, and had, had this proposal so um, I, I think um, we would do um, maybe a cursory check uh, annually uh, and see what the uh, the costs are relative to um, what were uh, uh, what the current uh, the, the current resolution is at the time, uh, and then um, and maybe comment on that. But at a minimum, every two years, I think would be appropriate. And in your resolution, it says just whereas from time to time, the board may need to update. The update. So you're not um, pinned to a particular duration um, or frequency. Um, but um, I guess you're you're depending upon staff to um, to inform you uh, that the ch the the costs we're seeing are starting to deviate from what the averages are. 
Okay, and we've we've already made what you're reminding me is is that we've already made provision for some kind of inflation because it does exist. Yeah. Um, okay. Ken, I just wanted to uh, tell you thanks, Bill. This looks great. Uh, I appreciate you taking a fresh look at this um, and also trying to recover our costs uh, appropriately. So I just wanted to pass along. Uh, you did a great job on this. Thank you. Yep. I appreciate the, the the kind words. I know McKenna Bell and Katrin Carrizo and uh, many others um, contributed to this. I, I just happened to read the, the messenger today. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, if there's no more discussion, can we move Danny, on to- Danny, Danny's got a question. Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to echo on it. Bill, I think this is very thoughtfully done. Um, nice work. I just want to make sure that even on tier ones, that we have some type of process that we're checking easements on those properties when the review comes up? Uh, um, <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, every now and then something slips through the cracks, but our, our process is um, when we receive a, uh, a permit application notice from the cities generally, um, we A, look at the location of um, the proposed development, its proximity, to um, the work that we do uh, on a day-to-day uh, -day or, or annual basis, and three, whether or not uh, we have the, the proper uh, real estate um, uh, tools for us to do our work. Um, every now and then something slips through the cracks, but uh, generally that's our process. And if any of those um, do uh, raise a flag for us, we normally kick it into a tier two. And my only other comment would be just making sure that um, we're aware and we meet all the, the timelines that the municipalities have for the application so that we're not behind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I appreciate you bringing up that point. Uh, that is something that uh, we talk about frequently. Um, and uh, there's, as you probably know, there's some tighter timelines on the land use reviews uh, than some others, but uh, we're keenly aware of those and, um, and, and, um, and, and uh, know that we need to hit those those milestones. Actually, even in some other cases, um, permit like street opening permits in the city of Portland, they only have a couple of days for us to respond. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so yes, we track those. Thank you. Sure. Are we ready to um, move to adopt the resolution? Can I start with uh, SDIC, please? Uh, I'll open up for discussion. Tani, Ken, I think you've had your questions answered. Any further discussion? No. If, if not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move uh, to approve resolution number R-2021-01-01 to update certain development re review standards and fee schedule for the development review program. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, Ken Anderton? I vote yes. Candy Staffenson? Yes. Tom Hansel votes yes. Uh, measure passes 3 0. Thanks, James. Uh, thank you. This is Mike Wells, president of MCDD. I'll entertain a motion for uh, resolution 2021 0101. It's, it's in page 44 of your packet. Uh, this is Corky. I'll move to approve resolution number R-2021-01-01 to update certain development review standards and, and fee schedule of the development review program. Second. I have a motion and a second to uh, take a roll call. Uh, Nancy Hendrickson. I vote aye. Ken Anderton. I vote aye. Corky Collier. Aye. Nikki Schultz. Aye. And Mike Wells votes yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, pen two, uh, Val Humble here. Uh, do I have a motion from Pen two uh, supervisor regarding uh, the development review program update? Oh, I thought Leslie was going to do. I'll read. Um, I move to approve resolution number R twenty twenty one dash o one dash o one to update certain development review standards and fee schedule of the development review program. I'll second that. 
Thank you, Mary Helen and Leslie. Uh, any discussion? Roll call vote, uh, Mary Helen. I vote aye. Karen Myers. I vote aye. Leslie Sire. I vote aye. Al Humble votes aye. The resolution is passed for pen two. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Pen one. Okay, looking for a motion. I'll move the adoption of the resolution. I don't have it in front of me. I apologize. Um, the resolution that was accompanied in the packet that was delivered to uh, the Pen One board in regular course. Uh, so I'll just move for that. Great. I can read that for you, Jeff. Um, I move to adopt resolution number R2021 0101 to update certain development review standards and fee schedule of the development review program. And I'm looking for a second. A second. Thank you, Claudio. We'll do a roll call vote. Emerald uh, is out, as I mentioned before, and Annalisa had to sign off a little bit early. Claudio Capizano. I vote aye. Jeff Noodleman. Aye. James Allison, I vote aye. The motion carries. And with that, um, thank you, Bill. Um, I know it's always a lot of uh, a lot of work to get to this point. Um, thank you everyone for trying to keep us on time. I appreciate it. We'll move on now to item E, assets and liabilities. Also with Bill. Yep, thank you. And I do want to express my sincere thanks for uh, your the passage because it, it took some time to get to this point. So I appreciate that. Um, so shifting to assets and liabilities, um, this is a follow-up um, topic to uh, the topic all of you um, uh, um, experience last week uh, during your individual board meetings. Um, I told you at the time that uh, I would come back to uh, let you know what type of feedback we received so the, all four boards could hear it at once. Um, in general, um, all four, and um, I'll, I'll provide an uh, my own um, assessment here, and uh, I appreciate others to chime in um, to fill in any gaps. But my understanding is um, all four boards were comfortable with the list of the project deliverables, the definitions of the assets and liabilities, as well as the valuation method um, we were planning to use for um, that calculation of the assets and liabilities. Um, there was um, a series of next steps that uh, we outlined, including more work for the, um, the working group meeting working group, sorry, um, uh, as well as uh, conducting a pilot uh, to, um, to sort of test drive, if you will, the valuation method and that those informa that information uh, is tentatively scheduled to uh, provide to you in March. So um, there honestly wasn't too much feedback um, beyond that. Um, there are a couple of folks did mention that it was worthwhile having a pilot. Uh, and so um, that's um, because that's uh, the sort of truth test, if you will, um, the, the, uh, the, the approach we're using. Um, but also there was a comment made about uh, uh, what are we doing about quality control? At least that's my interpretation. And, um, and uh, I'll let you know, we have um, separate set of eyes um, uh, internally at the at staff to um, conduct that um, quality control of any calculations and, and efforts there. Um, we, we did hire the financial specialist um, to um, provide us a, a, a pathway of how to complete this work. Um, and, um, and so those are the, the, the factors we're, we're, we currently have, I do have access to on-call contracts, engineering contracts in particular, um, if uh, I need to double check um, what type of methods we use to determine, for instance, remaining useful life uh, for certain types of assets. Um, and so that, that tool is available to me. Um, and the only thing I know has come up in past um, is uh, whether uh, we have um, that same financial specialist or potentially even our auditors to, um, to take a, a quick peek at the, a draft deliverable for the assets and liabilities for all four of your districts. Um, that's currently not in the, um, um, in, in the scope uh, or budget, but it's something I certainly can um, entertain and um, return to you 
back to you and with more details if you'd like me to uh, examine that further. Questions or discussion? Well, thank, thank you, Bill. That definitely encapsulates the discussion um, that we had last week. I really appreciate it. I think everyone, I know I'm curious to see what the preliminary results look like for different asset classes. Um, yeah, I agree. I think the slides that you put together, Bill, were really helped to put boundaries on this, understand how it works and what's included and what's not. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. All right. I appreciate your time. Okay, well, if, uh, if I can tell the time, it looks like we may have just jumped ahead in, in our schedule and we're ready to move on to item F, new business. Any new business. Since I gave everybody an update last week and we've had the conversation regarding um, the status of the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District, a substantive conversation. I don't have a lot of update other than um, there's a plan. I anticipate making a decision on the CFO this week. Um, and we are initiating that process and putting um, a draft position description for um, the executive director this putting some final touches on it this week that will go out to the individuals in our boards that are reviewing. So thank you. Okay, well, hearing no. I have a question. Um, is there a document that shows area of responsibilities? I know there's pin one and pin two and SDIC. Um, part of the conversations that I've been having is about who's responsible for drainage when you do have flooding in a particular area. Is there a document that shows who's responsible? I know there's been back and forth conversations um, between the city of Portland and between MCDD. Is there a document that shows who's responsible for what areas? So Ernest, um, this is Karen Carrillo. And if you um, have a moment to reference the email that was sent to you that includes a map of the four districts and their jurisdictions. I saw the map. So there's also an interactive map online. Um, and then I think um, Emily, I'm not sure to proceed with the meeting if we can. We're happy to provide any additional documentation um, that you'd like uh, once we get to that portion, to the portion of this out, um, the discussion on, on your particular issue in a minute. Well, I mean, it was more broader issue as far as areas of responsibility, not particularly my particular issue, but is there areas, is there a document that exists that says the dreams in certain areas? So, I mean, I just, because I see the map, but the map doesn't lead to the documentation that says pen one is fully responsible for this area or pen two is fully responsible for this area when it comes to actual drainage. Because in the discussions that me and you have had, is, is that that's the question of areas of responsibility, which there's back and forth between the MCDD and the city of Portland about ownership. I just want to know if there are documents that, that shows ownership. The map doesn't really tell you anything. It just shows you boundary line. But I know I want to know if there is a document that talks about ownership and responsibility. Uh, Ernest, this is the areas. It doesn't matter the area, any of the areas. So Ernest, this, this is this, you're asking questions with respect to the authority and obligations of the Pen 2 district, and we can reserve that for the Pen 2 uh, district portion of this meeting, um, well, because we do have other business to take care of for the other the other board members. And so we'll take up your question, which is a good one um, towards the end. I believe that there is some time reserved for Pen 2 towards the end. So I think we can reserve that. More broader for any district. Is there a document that covers any district? So it wasn't yes. just. There, there are many. <laughs> we'll find you the right one. Yeah, I think what we need to do is we do need to um, adjourn MCDD and Pen 1. I think we're at that point in the agenda. So uh, MCDD, do you want to adjourn? Yes, this is Mike Wells, President of MCDD, uh, adjourning the MCDD board. Thanks, everyone. Good meeting. Thank you, Mike. And this is James Allison. I'm adjourning the Pen 1 board.
James, this is Karen. Can I interrupt for a minute? We had an agenda item G, drainage master plan adoption. That'll be for SCIC only. Oh, sorry. Okay, no. thank you. Thanks, Karen. All right, um, I guess that uh, it looks like um, SDIC and, and Pen2 will stay on the call and the rest of us will drop off. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. Thanks, Thank James. You, James. Super. Thank you, folks. Good Thank to you, see you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. This is uh, Tom. Uh, Amber, uh, are you with us? Bill, would you feel comfortable taking this? I'm not sure there's much else to discuss. I think you all, we covered it all last week. And so I, I think this hopefully will be kind of a uh, consent agenda item. Uh, agreed. So I'll go ahead and open up for discussion with uh, SDSC board members. Comments on the uh, updates made? Tammy? Yeah, I'm I'm good. Are you, um, Ken, you okay? I'm good. I, okay. I forgot we hadn't approved it yet, but I think we're ready. Well, we just want to <laughs> tweak it a little bit. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, I move to approve resolution R two zero one two zero two to adopt the findings of the twenty twenty drainage master plan. And I will second that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Ken Anderton. Ken Anderton votes aye. Danny Staffenson. Aye. And Tom Hansel votes yes as well. Uh, Bill, please extend our appreciation to Amber uh, for her work and uh, you know hearing us through. Uh, much thanks to you and your team. Yep, I appreciate that feedback, and she'll be happy uh, to hear this. I think. Uh, SDIC is clear to adjourn. Uh, we thank MCDD staff for supporting us. Have a good evening or afternoon. Thanks, Brian. Hey, take care. So this is Val Humble. Pen2 is still in session. If there is uh, no objection, I'd like to invert the order of the last two uh, agenda items and deal with the rainfall event update, update before the appointment of Pen2 vacancy. Bill, would you like to present your issues? Uh, I, I would. And I appreciate uh, Ernest staying on for this as well. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a little some time to, before this, uh, present, this agenda item came. Um, so let me share my screen um, so I can show you. I want to make sure that everyone has the same um, amount of information. Are you all able to see that uh, mm -mm. The image? Nope, not yet, sorry. And now? Yes. Okay. All right, very good. So um, as um, the Pentu board members know, um, this area is, um, uh, area just west of Northeast 13th Avenue, um, and the, the low-lying areas between South Shore and Philoma Roads. Um, we, as, as the drainage area knows, uh, sorry, the, pen, the board knows, this is an area that um, has had high water issues for some time. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, just give you a very brief history about this. Some of you can um, explain the history even um, more thoroughly than I can, but uh, I'll at least give you my uh, understanding and, um, and we can move on to what happened last week and moving forward. In general, uh, this particular drainage area is split um, because there's hot, there's, um, uh, someone has uh, put in uh, uh, quite a bit of material in their backyard. So now there is a, an, a small pipe that runs underneath the berm um, between uh, the two areas of orange that are sh shown here. 
And uh, yes, or last week, um, the area on the right hand side is the one that received uh, quite a bit of high water. So brief history, um, the uh, area um, back, uh, you know, prior to 2015 when I came in, um, had started seeing some um, issues with uh, the drainage sl um, slowing down and, and um, draining away from that area. Um, and um, from actually from what I, I, I've heard from emails since that that, er that issues uh, occurred even you know prior to 2010. Um, but in 2015, just before I came on board here, uh, MCD stall, uh, installed a temporary pump to supplement the drainage in this area. Um, per the uh, board's direction in the spring of 2017, we removed that um, and uh, reinstalled it in 2018 for, uh, for a few months before removing it again in May of that same year. Um, as a reminder, uh, you had asked that we uh, send out a, a notice to property owners in October of that year saying um, that uh, the district can provide materials such as sandbags and sand, as well as technical assistance to property owners to help them individually address uh, future flooding on their property. We knew at the time uh, and had been talking to the city of Portland for some time about their pipe in Northeast 13th um, uh, uh, Avenue uh, it was uh, in poor shape. Um, they were able to uh, provide some assistance on that to help us investigate that more and um, were eventually uh, agreed that, yeah, this pipe is in, in, in rough shape and um, they uh, fast tracked uh, their efforts to put it on their capital program. And, and in January of 2020, they began the capital project uh, to replace the storm system. Um, so uh, last week, particularly uh, January 11th and 12th, there was 2.3 inches of rain that fell over 30 hours. Um, that's, that's a decent amount of rain for our area. Um, but what's notable is that the, the soils were already pretty saturated because of the rain that occurred the previous 10 days. Um, I was uh, talking to a colleague of mine and uh, noted that uh, while the 2.3 inches is is a, a little elevated, um, it came in, in a burst, uh, a couple bursts, and one of those was um, we had we had uh, determined it was about a five-year event, um, as opposed to a one-year event that happens every one year or every 25 years or so forth. So it's about a five-year event that uh, created the situation that you see here on the screen. Um, there are two properties in particular that were affected. Uh, um, Ernest's property off on the right and uh, another property on the left-hand side, there's a, uh, a shed that uh, is probably the lowest building uh, in that uh, drainage area. And there was approximately 18 to 24 inches of water in that shed. So what, what did we do? Um, uh, as you know, we, we, have, we had removed that pump uh, in May um, and provide sandbags for those who are interested. Um, and, you know, I think by some luck, we have had some relatively mild uh, winters in terms of intense rainstorms over the last two seasons, uh, but it kind of caught up with us this year. Um, so uh, we started talking to um, um, uh, Ernest's family and, uh, and the other property owner on the other side in Philoma uh, early in the week. Uh, and um, by Wednesday, um, both city and MCD staff made separate inspections of the area um, and uh, to understand what the, the extent of the flooding was uh, or the high water was and flooding in some, in, in some cases here. So um, on Thursday, we delivered, we filled and delivered sandbags to those two properties and began pumping. Um, we had to um, stop pumping because the um, the direction of water that we were sending it to was not draining quickly. Um, and so um, on Friday, we um, changed our strategy of how we pumped. Um, and we ended up going straight down, uh, paralleling Northeast 13th Avenue uh, down to the ditch um, that uh, you guys probably have seen um, uh, driving in your area. So the photos here, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so um, th that pumped for a while. Um, until Saturday when we found that the hose connection was damaged. So we turned off the pump because water was spewing onto the street a fair amount. On Tuesday, we um, resumed pumping after getting that fixed and ended after, 40, after four hours 
um, because uh, at some point the suction hose um, is uh, gets down the water below the suction hose gets so low um, that you can't pump effectively anymore. You start cavitating the pump and damaging the pump. So we stopped pumping once we thought we were starting to damage the pump. So all told, and, and that on Wednesday morning, I think we removed the temporary pump and hose. All told, we pumped for about 37 hours. Mm -hmm. And um, the, um, the, um, the photos you see here include the sandbags, uh, the, uh, the pump setup, uh, the manhole that we pulled from, as well as the piping, uh, the hose that we uh, used uh, to go down Northeast 13th. Um, uh, as, you, as you probably saw, um, uh, people were able to drive over those hoses um, to get into their driveways or go across South Shore. So uh, we felt somewhat comfortable with, uh, with that situation because it was a short term situation. Um, any event um, that was uh, the setup and we finished on the 20th and we spent approximately um, $13,000 uh, all told uh, for that week plus uh, as, as part of the storm response. Um, as you've heard before, um, BES uh, was able to fast track the, uh, the capital, their capital project a little bit to, um, um, to start and they anticipate construction this fall to replace that pipe um, that um, I, I feel are, is um, one of the root causes of, of the slow drainage in that area. Um, and so with that improvement, um, I expect that storms that are um, probably you know, 10, 25 year event storms uh, should reduce um, the, flood, the high water uh, substantially. Uh, but anything beyond 25 year event, of course, uh, you'll, that those properties will still see uh, a fair amount of backwater. Um, so the question for, for you all um, uh, is uh, what do we do between now and fall of 2021? And then um, after the, uh, the pipe is, uh, um, is uh, installed by BES. Currently um, our, um, uh, um, our position and my position is that we um, we follow what the board's uh, advice uh, and direction has been previously, uh, where we um, uh, we help property owners out in that area um, with uh, with sandbags and material um, to help them um, uh, address flooding problems on their particular property. Um, and provide some technical advice where we think uh, it, would, it, would be, it would be helpful um, as they try to address high, um, how uh, high water might impact their own property. Um, but by the, and between now and that point until fall of 2021, if the water um, exceeds the height of the sandbag wall that um, had already been, um, had been erected at the, next to that shed, which happened this last time, um, there's uh, my, my instinct was that would be to go back out there and pump the water down again, similar to what we did. So um, that's my proposal to you. And uh, I certainly welcome uh, thoughts and questions about that. This is Tom Humble. Uh, a, a couple of questions, Bill. <clears throat> my memory is that the pipe uh, from that uh, slough, shall we say, into the, uh, the manhole from which you pumped it does not reach the bottom, the lowest point in this thing, that it's, it's elevated and that, even, that any drainage through those pipes would not remove all water. Is that right? And how much water, how deep would it remain before it got to that pipe? Uh, so your, your statement, Val, is accurate. Um, the pipe at the very end is an 18 inch concrete pipe that does um, um, allow water to go into that public manhole. Um, I honestly don't know what the, the total depth would be at this point, um, and because I, I haven't gone out and, um, and measured what the, the elevation of the bottom of that pipe is versus the bottom of uh, uh, another set of twin culverts that's just upstream of there. Okay, the point is, there, the point is there will definitely be water in the ditch um, even after that uh, the city's work is done. Can you tell us whether that's the level it's at now at the, at the bottom of the pipe? Uh, as of the 20, bottom of the pipe. Um, 
as of the uh, as of last let's see as of this Tuesday um, it was I think it was about I think it was just below the crown of that pipe so it wasn't at the bottom of the pipe okay the other direction uh, where that where one of the neighbors is filled and there there appears to be a pipe but we don't know if it connects through if that the uh, eastern portion of the ditch uh, connected to the western portion, does the western portion drain in the other, off to the west? It does actually, you know, uh, before, and some of you may know this, that um, before the Northeast 13th Avenue pump station was installed, um, water actually flowed from the east to the west. And so uh, there was some grading that was done to um, shift water to push more towards uh, the area near Fazio's farm. So that, so that fill done by the neighbor produced part of the problem for the eastern uh, portion. It, was there no, at the time there was no development review or any permission from the drainage district obtained for that fill, is that correct as far as you know? Uh, you know Val, I don't have any records of that. Uh, of okay. that fill. I have talked to uh, Dave Hendricks, who is uh, a staff member here for some time, and um, he remembers um, some of that fill going on, but I'm, yeah, at, at the, I don't have any records um, of going there. And, and actually, in this case, uh, the water may, um, if that pipe was big enough, water may um, drain um, from the east to the west, uh, um, but there's really nowhere for that water on the western side to go. Uh, so it just ponds. I misunderstood. So, I thought you just told me that, that on the west it does drain away. Sorry, no. I, I, I might have misspoke though. So on this page where um, there's a call out that says 820 Northeast Paloma Road on the left hand side. Yeah. The, um, the orange area there doesn't drain anywhere except for the east now under that pipe. So okay, so, so is, the pipe through the fill actually moves east. Water, any water moves east through that pipe. That's, that's my understanding. Mary Ellen, did you want to add something to that? Um, I just, um, is Hong still on the call? I am. Okay. Um, just a couple of comments and you might be able to enlighten. The issue with the homeowner, because um, I went out with Dave Hendricks um, and for the, I'm not going to say illegal fill, but it was garbage. Um, and for him dumping in. Um, Dave Hendricks was having no luck dealing with the person. This is anecdotal, so it's not legal. And um, I don't think it was ever determined who had a right to remove that garbage, but the homeowner was um, not in agreement that anybody could remove the garbage from his property or access his property. And so the whole idea of easement, um, who had rights, uh, damages caused, all of those things. Um, and uh, I got out of the conversation when Dave started a conversation with the city and I think the homeowner's wishes were honored. Um, but I, if you could speak to, mm, let's say every homeowner along that ditch went and dumped their garbage um, in there, or I, I mean, I know it's wrong, but what grounds do we have to say, uh, or, or we, um, Penn 2 or the city, and somebody smarter than me, um, have to say, we need to remove that and there's a fine for you dumping your garbage in there? Well, before you answer, can I answer that question? Because I've been living there since 2005, and I can tell you exactly what happened. Well, no, it, it's not on, it's at the end of Philoma. Um, because there's another story about those new houses that were built near you on the slope. And I have some anecdotal about that and easements. But if Hong could just give us a legal answer, um, I, I'd like to hear that. And I'd also like to hear what you have to say, Ernest, but I'd like to hear what Hong has to say about if there was a perfect world, what would it be? <laughs> and Hong, if I may interject just for a minute, I just wanted to acknowledge that we had a second um, property owner from this area joining our call. So Kathy Ramos, um, or Ramos, sorry if I mispronounced that, Kathy, um, is joining us and um, she had just asked if she could have a couple of minutes to speak when it's appropriate. 
Sure. Welcome, Kathy. Ernest, uh, my name is Hong. I'm, I'm the attorney for the district here. So in terms of authority obligations and, um, and to your question, Ernest, who's responsible for what, where, I can tell you what um, the district is obligated to do. And we've searched our files and consistent with Mary Helen's history, uh, we were not able to find anything in writing that allows us to, or required us to maintain this area um, because of the, there's, a, this is a generally a, an area that collects from uh, the private properties um, based on our, you know, critical uh, drainage analysis. This is not something that is recognized as public drainage that we would have jurisdiction over for precisely the question, uh, the point of Mary Helen's um, point is we don't have um, access to this. We were granted access as a third party beneficiary in 1937, some time ago, but it's not clear that that uh, it was for the kind of work that that you want us to do um, or, or for this area. So as it stands, most of our work uh, and obligation to conduct uh, operation and maintenance, including pumping and things of those sort is uh, contingent on an analysis of whether there's critical drainage um, or not going through this uh, a slew way like this. And if it's not, then it's not something that falls within the jurisdiction of the district uh, on a mandatory basis. Now, having said that, the district does have general authority over all drainage. So to the extent there's a desire to hook this up to um, the public drainage way that is under our jurisdiction, that would need to go through our development review and an approval by this board. Having said that, um, we also have authority to address and respond to emergency, which, which Bill and his team did on behalf for the benefit of the um, property owners um, earlier this week or last week. So for the moment, Ernest, and, and um, uh, we don't have an obligation to maintain and pump this water out. Um, as, as such, you could see the evidence in the past efforts to in install temporary pumps. It's, it's not a long-term uh, solution. And um, it is something that you know, we, the, this board would have to decide. And with Bill's, um, uh, Bill's team's analysis, if it's something that should be part of our regular O&M um, or not. It is a, uh, if, if that decision is made, there's a cost associated with that. But at this point, this is a private property drainage issue. And to the extent there's blockage at the end, um, obviously that, that is a jurisdictional issue with the BES. So, okay. so that's the, the, the statutory obligation part of it. Of course, it's within the discretion of, of this board and at Bill's recommendation if this is something the board wants to take on permanently. This is Val Humble. I, the way I might rephrase it is, that area is not a drainage ditch. It's a water feature. It's a seasonally dry lake. And there's at least one property owner I'm aware of who wants it to be a water feature. Uh, and it has been forever, essentially. It, there is that drainage uh, through the uh, Bureau of Environment, uh, uh, Environmental Services, BES, that prevents it from getting super high. But that's not our pipe, that's the, that's the, uh, the city environmental services pipe, and they're going to repair the root damage to that pipe this fall. That, is that a fair summary of? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it, this is a private property uh, matter. And so as such, we don't have um, public easement rights to go on to do any of the work um, to do the kind of work that is being asked of us. So if there's a desire for this to be a public drainage uh, responsibility on us and the district take on permanently as part of its operation and maintenance, there has to be a, a, you know, a collective effort by all of those lands in there to give us express easement rights to go in there in our name. We don't even have that in this case. So, so uh, it's, it's hard for us to go in because we don't know which property owner to, to listen to. It's not, this is not a public drainage matter. It's a, it's a private drainage issue. And can I ask one other question? Can it be site specific? So for instance, my backyard gets huge puddles because the water runs downhill from levee. 
not anything like this, but, um, and so we, we recommended way back when French drains, we put those on the property, et cetera. Um, the street belongs to Peabody, it went through all kinds of stuff. But what I'm saying is, is there's th this neighborhood is in a floodplain. So can we say we'll help this street in this place and leave it up to different sections, different homeowners, and how can that be addressed? Because as a board supervisor, I represent all and represent individuals. And I wanna make sure that we provide service to everyone in an equitable fashion. Um, and if there are people, uh, there's people at the end of, um, what is it, uh, Blue Heron Drive, the original property developer, uh, the Blue Heron wetlands fill up and go into their backyards. Blue Heron wetlands are privately owned by a homeowners association that doesn't exist. Um, so there's all kinds of complications. And so I, I'm trying to get to the bigger picture of how we can protect um, the neighbors on Philoma and South Shore who have um, suffered different times. Uh, the, there's all kinds of anecdotal evidence of you know, the water raising up onto people's patios on those newer homes. I think it's 953. Sarah Whitefield, the former chair of the neighborhood, chased this issue for uh, a number of years. And as you so adeptly identified, Hung, there are some people, or Val did, there are some people that like the water feature and completely raised extreme concerns about doing nothing that would damage their ability to have a water feature outside their patio. So while some people like it, some people don't, and how we make that decision and legally how we get there, I think is a much bigger discussion. But for the immediate term, um, I'd like to hear from the two neighbors. Um, and Ernest, I, I know of your property because I've often commented about the high water that's there. So this seemed to be a, a little bit more extreme event, but maybe speak to us about how many, if you've been here since 2005, I, I think I've seen your um, storage sheds inundated with water before. So um, I, 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 as a board supervisor, need to know how best to handle this. And we can't answer that today, I don't think. But I'd like to hear the comments from the neighbors, since they both seem to have lived there a long time. Hi. Well, I um, my name is Kathy and I'm the one with the sheds that, and I'm the one at the lowest point. So it's my property that gets inundated with the water. And the last time this happened, apparently, cause this is my father-in-law owns this property and he's been here in, since the nineties. And the last time it filled up was the 96 flood, 96, 97. And it went up a lot higher back then, but my question, or I've questioned several times because it was understood that the property um, in that water ditch was MCDD and we could not touch it. We could not do anything because it was your property. Even though it runs through private property, we were always told that it was their property. So in 96, they did come and dig further down and uh, widen it a little bit. And that was the last time anything's been done over there. So um, I guess I'm kind of really, really confused on how all of a sudden MCDD is saying, no, it's not our responsibility. It's a water, uh, you know, a water feature. But if that's the case, then what is refraining us or what is stopping us from filling in those and avoiding this in the future? Uh, so with respect to the, um, the uh, property history, Kathy, we, we have in our file just an old easement um, dated 1937. It was actually a deed between two property owners uh, that were conveying title and it referenced um, not MCDD but Pen 2 um, as having uh, can, can be permitted to go in and do drainage work. Uh, that's about the extent of the reference to any drainage district um, 
um, existence in, in that area. So we don't own it. It's, it's not ours. So if you want to, I suppose if you want to go in and fill it, you know, you, you can. Um, it's not, at the moment, it's not our, our responsibility. So, um, there, so I think there needs to be an understanding of what the facts are with respect to the history and until, um, unless I see a record that we held title to the drainage way or that there's an express easement in our name, um, it doesn't belong to us. We don't have jurisdiction at the moment. And so we can I, legally go in and fill it in and stop this and I can raise and hire my grounds. Sure. I, I, my only question would, it's not of our concern. I don't know who might have jurisdiction on right. film. That film may require, depending on how much film may be required to go through the division of state land um, or some other organization. I don't want to, it to be misconstrued that we're telling you it's okay. All we know is we don't have jurisdiction over that property. And I'll, I just want to add a little bit more anecdotal, anecdotal information. Um, it depends on who you talk to, who's going to tell you what the property is. Um, you have several neighbors that um, have sounded the alarm that if somebody did something, that if the drainage district or somebody, meaning another property owner, did something that caused harm to their property, uh, it, the, the liability involved for property damage. And then the city, over the course of my hearing these things as a land use chair and as the chair of the neighborhood, um, was that uh, everybody had their individual opinion. And so as Hong pointed out, if you do something on your property that one of your neighbors doesn't like, I, I don't know how to phrase that any better, um, they can ask for a uh, inspection. And if it's deemed that you've put too much fill and there's limits and I don't know those, somebody's smarter than me, uh, you can be held liable for not having a proper permit to do that. And I, I, I think it's a very, very complicated issue. And when this came up this week, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I rolled my eyes and thought, oh, here we go again. But I think the best solution is, is to find the best remedy for the majority of homeowners. And in um, issues like this, nobody ever agrees. You don't get full compliance. And if you do, you're really, really lucky. <clears throat> but I think that what we need to explore um, is how best to help you enjoy your property. Um, and we're not going to settle that today. And I know that there's, uh, I, I, I knew one of the people that owned one of the houses, the, those newer houses on South Shore, the two of them, um, and actually the current residents, still an original owner. Um, they'd like to see something done, but they've pursued work to raise their decks or put in more landfill and have met resistance with the city. So um, I'm going to propose that we explore this further um, and if it's okay, engage Kathy and Ernest in this because they have um, hands-on experience, but there's and Karen, you might be able to fill in here because there's other people along there and this could mm -hmm. be a community. Even though it's not MCDD property, we as Penn 2 people are gonna, board supervisors are gonna have to uh, at, at least come to some sort of conclusion of how that ditch, and that's not the only one that's affected. There's some on Sixth Avenue, um, not as critical because there's not as many landowners. So that's, that's my recommendation. I, I guess here's my question is, <clears throat> one of the questions that Kathy asked uh, Han about was that the previous maintenance that was done on the property, and, and, and to be totally transparent, I don't think Han actually answered her question, is that there was, for lack of a better word, there was an agreement that would allow MC, MCDD to come in and do some work. So clearly with as long as Kathy been on that property, MCDD came in and did some maintenance work on that particular property. For whatever reason, MCD, MCDD made the decision to stop doing that work. 
So my question is one, why did they stop doing that work? And Kathy's been there long enough to know that that property using the agreement or the easement agreement or whatever the case may be, they was able to come in and do some maintenance. So my question is why was a decision made from MCDD to stop doing that maintenance? I'm not talking about whether or not uh, MCDD was liable or they're responsible for it. To a degree they was doing that maintenance. That was the question that she asked was why did it stop? So that's one question okay. um, that I don't think that was actually addressed. The, you might have a little bit of that? an answer. Well, uh, well, I'm gonna finish. The other question is, is that it was to the point that Bill had made is that when uh, MCDD to come in to drain that water, it was drained from the high point, but there were still low points that had excessive water. And I even showed you the pictures where uh, um, there's a significant amount of water that was actually remaining. So when he says that MCDD comes in to provide technical assistance, how do you define technical assistance? And to be totally transparent, giving a homeowner sandbags is not technical assistance. If you are going to provide solutions to homeowners, they have to be real solutions. They can't be, we'll drop off 300 sandbags and let you work out the rest. That is not technical assistance. It's how do you protect your property? Whether it's going in and providing some type of relief, technical assistance would be, we've drained the water from the high point I see there's some of the lower properties actually still being affected. Let's see if we can't readjust that pump and see if we can pull some of that water out from the lower points. So MCD is they're really not trying to drive toward a solution and help these homeowners. They're temporary fixes and everybody wants to fall back on a point where we're not responsible. Now, when you look at the previous homeowner, that previous homeowner went and filled in his land on his own. He filled in his land on his own until the point that Kathy just made is that if my home is going to constantly be at risk, then yeah, I'm agreeing with the previous homeowner did and fill in and create my own miniature dam and everybody along that waterway can fill in their own miniature dam. Because if at the end of the day, if MCDD is saying we have no responsibility and good luck with that, then it is up to the individual homeowners to protect their own property. What I'm looking for from this board is a real conversation about driving solutions. And so far, what I've heard is that we're not really responsible. But and as far as technical assistance, um, bringing in and draining the water from a high point and then not getting back with the landowners and saying, let's get together and think about how we can get some of that water out from the lower points. Maybe we can move it on to one of your properties. You know, maybe we can readjust. Those conversations do not take place with the homeowners. It's only MCDD deciding what they want to do, mutual exclusive of any conversations with the homeowners. And as far as the city's fast tracking, five years ain't fast tracking. There's been flooding issues in that area for years. So this ain't fast track. And I don't want anyone thinking that, hey, we, we identified an issue and we're trying to get it fixed. This has been there for years and I know because I've been calling MCDD for years. So if we're gonna have a conversation about driving solutions, the conversation has to start with authenticity. So, um, uh, I'm just gonna di disagree one second. Um, I've been involved in neighborhood um, issues, land use, all sorts of things for 17 years. Um, and I totally disagree with you that MCDD has not been responsive. We have annual landowner meetings. We've had community events. Um, I personally have gone out and talked to neighbors. I don't know whether I talked to you, but I, I went up and down the streets of uh, Faloma and um, South Shore with Dave Hendricks. Um, and we talked to a number of people. And like I said previously, got a number of answers and responses. So I, I want the same conclusion as you do something that would be helpful. Um, and if this is a land special landowners meeting, so be it. Uh, there are other people that, besides South Shore and Philoma in other parts of the neighborhood that suffer from um, uh, flooding. Uh, and they've been provided with technical advice. But I, I think that we need to be cognizant of what has been done and um, have a total picture here so uh, I, I'm going to, the one point I'm gonna disagree with you is MCDD has done nothing. 
um, and it's a, a lot of early intervention and I'm going to say quote unquote work is because of oral agreements and talking to people. Can we help you do this? Um, there was a different pump. There were two different pumps. And that pump we're talking about, Bill can speak to it. And I don't know whether he received complaints, but I already have heard that it was too noisy and they wanted to take it out. And the noise office, because I'm involved with the city noise office, received three complaints about the noise of the pump and they wanted it removed. So Paul Van Orden, the noise officer, went out and inspected it measured it. It wasn't at the decibel level during the hours and it couldn't operate after 10 o'clock unless it was declared an emergency. It didn't fit those needs. So I, I, I think we need to get all the information out there and I cannot be on this call much longer, but I, I would like to be able to, and I'll leave it to Karen and Peggy D or whatever, um, Bill, um, talk further about this because there are other people out there with other concerns and it's not clear who owns what and who can do what. We might not like the answer that we've been given, but um, we need to be able to say to people, this is what is, this is what we've done and go from there. So let me just address the question of, of a past authorization. Ernest, the, the deed I'm talking about was between two private landowners the drainage district was not a party to that. So it, 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 they signed the deed and they hoist the permission onto the drainage district. We did not sign on to that. So there was no, the only way we, we knew about it is, is doing a title search for references of drainage. So there's no way that the district would have known about it unless the property owners would have executed some sort of easement in which the district is a party. So that is one reason why there is no obligation to do the work. And I think, and, and Bill, and, and obviously Karen, I think um, can address the history of this, but the reason why they, they stop is because they realized they didn't, the district didn't own this, this issue and, um, and realized that what they've been providing for is, is just a temporary, again, sort of emergency response fix, temporary fix to what is otherwise a private issue. Now, to the extent that um, after the board members hear today on what they must do in terms of their obligation, they will assess that in light of what they should do and could do in light of um, yours and, and Kathy's concern. And that is well within their discretion. So, so um, the, their desire to ask these questions and us having this conversation is them collecting information for them to make uh, a good policy decision as board members. You want them to do that. So I'll turn it over to either Bill or Karen to talk about why it stopped in, in the past and uh, I answer your question about the technical fix. Well, well let, me, let me interject one quick point. Let's, instead of talking about why they stopped in the past, let's talk about the issue today is that still a significant portion of my property is underwater. So Bill has already identified the fact that he's drained the water from the high point. Okay, so, and the draining from the high point has actually caused some of the sediment to actually impact the pump. So my question is, can that pump be readjusted to remove water from the low points in order to reduce some of the water that's currently sitting in my backyard, which I've already sent you pictures of. And so the uh, the short answer Ernest, is yes. It could be re it could be repositioned to a location where we had it previously um, when the pump was out there for three years, um, and that area is lower than the manhole that we um, that where we placed it and drew drew the water down to um, where it was where it is now. But I will, um, I will defer to our board with regards to what um, they want me to go out there and, and, and reposition that. This, this is Val Humble, president of the Pen 2 board. For clarification, the responsibility is Pen 2 drainage district responsibility. All of the MCDD actions, uh, reactions, uh, public relations and stuff is because Pen 2 hires MCDD to handle those functions for us. So any legal issues are legal issues with Pen 2. MCDD simply is our, our agents in responding to that. But the issue seems to me is it is pretty clear 
we do not have a legal responsibility for that water. The question is, do we have a moral or social responsibility to help out a, a, a property owner who has a problem? The question then becomes, uh, do we spend the taxpayer's money, other people in the districts who pay taxes, do we spend their money to improve some private person's property? Uh, that, that's the moral question, really, and our responsibility as I see it. Exactly. I agree. I would agree with that to one point. If Pen2 knew that pump was not working and that temporary pump was in for three years, how do you guys not take responsibility for the negligence of not fixing that pump sooner so we wouldn't have these problems? Because it is negligent. If you knew the temporary pumps were there for three years, that's that's negligence to not look for a solution then. You guys put in a temporary pump, but didn't look for a solution of where the pipe was broken, what was going on, and here we are now. So now it's been a total of, what, six years that you, since you guys put in those temporary pumps, and now we're having all this, you know, if the pumps work correctly, you know, then I would be I would be sitting here saying, okay, maybe it is my responsibility, and I need to look for other avenues. And of course, if I decide to fill my private property, I will go the legal route. I will go and get any permits. But if you're telling me that Pen2 or MCDD is not responsible, then that's the route I'm going to take. And I'm pretty sure my two neighbors on both my sides, because I'm the lowest point on the street, do not disagree with me, because their, their properties are just as much in danger as mine, even though they've got more freedom in their property, whereas I have a kennel with li live animals there. I have a garage with electrical, with water heater, furnace, and everything for the mother-in-law quarters. So I'm a little more in affected, and it just kind of frustrates me where we're going through this back and forth. I've already spoken to the city about this. And of course, they're saying they're not responsible because it's not on the uh, street level or it's not anything that they deal with. So I'm just kind of frustrated that it's just going back and forth, but there was a lot of negligence with that pump. I mean, that pump has been broken for years. It could have saved a lot of money. And I'm not asking you to repair my private property. What I'm asking is to keep the waters low. And could have done that by repairing that pump sooner and not waiting six years. Well, here's a quick answer. Here's a quick answer. And, and Val actually uh, spoke to it. But to address this question, everybody pays taxes. Whether it's, it's helping to give somebody relief for their private property that's flooding, everybody pays taxes. So everybody pays in. And so when you think about um, putting that pump, as Bill just suggested, reposition it so it can remove the remainder of that water. What is the level of effort that is required to do that? So Bill 1 can answer that question. And it's probably not a whole lot because they install and remove that pump relatively quickly. But getting to your question of, it's not a legal responsibility as Han actually just spoke. But the question is, what is the moral responsibility to give people relief? And at the end of the day, the board members are on this call right now, and you guys can make the decision to say, hey, Bill, go put that pump out there for a day to draw the remainder of the water levels down so the neighbors can get some relief. This isn't a hard topic, and it's not a hard subject. The board members are here. You can make the decision now, and Bill can have that pump out probably tomorrow, and in two days, all the water be drawn down. So it's not a, maybe a long-term solution may be put in place, but the short-term fix really ain't that hard. And I just say, we've done these short-term fixes over the years so many times. The bill is, what, over $100,000 now? Exactly. Um, so it, it, it just keeps accumulating. Uh, we, I understand your frustration. I, I've had water problems myself. It, I, but I think uh, Kathy is on point there. The only solution is going to be to privately fill, according to the law, if you don't want water in your backyard, your your property is low and uh, we don't have access to it. Uh, it's not one of our drainage ditches. We have helped in the past because we put a temporary pump on there in the past. Uh, uh, 
you should not infer that we're, we must always maintain that temporary pump. It was something we did to help, but, but it is not in the best interests of our tax paying public to continue to do it every time it rains. Well, and, 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 and well, let's be clear about my statement. I did not say every time it rains and I did not say you must. What I said was as a result of the torrential rains that we've recently had to provide those neighbors with a little relief. But here's my question is my suggestion is I would like to hear from the board members of whether or not they're gonna ask Bill to put that pump out there for a day. So I would like to hear from each of the board members and put it to a vote. I wanna hear what everybody's individual position is if whether or not they're gonna give uh, the neighbors whose property is flooding some relief. So instead of having sort of the, the conversation, I want the firm position if y'all gonna, if y'all gonna. We, uh, we made such a decision in, was it 2018 or 2017? Um, I, for one, uh, believe we should stand by that decision and not uh, uh, reinstall it to the lowest point. Karen, what is your point? I agree with you, Val. We made that decision because of the expense. We'd already put $100,000 into the project of draining private property at that time. And we thought it was time for the homeowners to take over some of the expense themselves. So uh, I agree with Val. You're, you're muted, Mary Helen. Are you alive? Um, I, I, I'm still going to go to a position of um, we have supported those homeowners to the tune of $100,000. Um, I understand the grief because I've experienced it since whenever at 2003 when I moved here and got involved in neighborhood if every neighbor that suffered an issue and I'm going to take a neighbor two doors down from me had a tree fall on somebody's fence because of the wind and it went into the wetlands which didn't belong to anybody but out of a course of good heartedness uh, the Pen2 board then um, agreed to come out and saw the tree up. Um, and that led to enhancements um, to some of the areas around there. Uh, there are neighbors on 13th that um, have large properties. Um, the city is one of the major ones. I don't know if you're familiar with on 13th, but they used to call the bean field and it's across from the golf course. And there is a ditch there that has affected Gulf Court Road people who have privately paid for the uh, work that they've had done that probably staff at um, MCDD don't even know that's been done. So there are other, other options than, um, and back to Hong's statement and clarity on we, we, we can, if a homeowner wants to employ the city or MCDD to provide services, we can do that. But is it best to use our other property owners um, assessment fees to help individuals who have the ability to come to a meeting to um, request help? And I, I think there needs to be some accountability to those who own the land. And if it's to fill it in and get all the permits and do that, so be it. Because that's like me trying to go to my neighbors. Um, this might not be a good analogy, but go to my neighbors and cut their tree down so it doesn't fall on my fence someday. Um, and I, I'm trying to be um, sympathetic to the needs and you benefited from the $100,000 that we've spent on pumps previously. And maybe they haven't performed to everybody's um, uh, wishes. I'm trying to use the right words here, but there you do have neighbors who would, 
and pardon my French, will raise holy hell if we went in and did something to not have that water be in that ditch. So I, I agree with Val and Karen on this. Um, I, in overall looking at the issue, um, I'm trying to be efficient and um, aware of all the residents of Pen2 as opposed to individual requests for service. That said, I don't know how agreements can be made and we'll certainly be looking at it um, for future events like this because it's only gonna get worse as far as your climate change scientists say. Thank you, Mary Helen. Uh, Ernest, uh, would you be willing to pay the cost of installing the temporary pump for uh, a few days? Uh, Bill, about what it would be. Yeah, you know, I was trying to calculate that on the fly here. Um, I, I would expect it would be two thousand dollars or less. So, Curtis, are you willing to, to pay that uh, to get your water pump, uh, the property pump, down, down this time? Okay, send me an itemized bill. Um, bill, would you? If you ask me if I'm willing to pay, send me an itemized bill of the cost. I mean, just not going to make up a number and say, are you willing to pay? To protect my property, let's just be honest. My house costs over $400,000, dollars 2000 ain't a lot. Okay, Bill, would you, uh, would you uh, contact Ernest and, and get an agreement that he's going to pay and uh, then get back with us and we'll, we'll decide whether we're going to uh, go on, go ahead with that. I, we haven't given Leslie an opportunity to express uh, her position. Well, Leslie was sitting back and waiting because you guys are all much more involved with that area of the um, district than I am. But I agree with you that um, the district has paid a lot already for um, personal property or you know private property issues. And so, no, I don't think we should do anything. Okay, so I guess the path forward would be for uh, Ernest and Bill to create uh, an explicit agreement that might <laughs> enforceable and then get back with uh, with us uh, a pen to uh, approval to either uh, um, assume that Ernest will in fact pay that bill now let's be let's be clear about paying that bill I'm paying for my property to be drained not the whole neighborhood so the pump is going to be on my property at, at, at a, uh, of course water is going to flow into there from the other properties you realize well, yeah I understand uh, but I would love to see the detail, making sure that my, because it may, some may flow, but, but that's fine. What so you're saying, you, you want the pump to reach the low spot in your property. That is correct. So I'm interested understood. to see on the cost of that. That's understood. And, and if I understand, Val, I'll, I, if I may, this is Peggy, I would just like to say that um, what we can do is provide an S cost estimate, which gives, Bill can prepare a cost estimate to be able to share with Ernest because it sounds to me, he wants to understand how it'd be broken out and what those costs would be. And that why, could then be- uh, Why don't we try to make it in a won't exceed number so that the Ernest can know that he's not gonna be dinged for something more than that. Well, well can uh, I say one thing? It, it, it It's of, I think, Ernest's concern is for today. And I'm perfectly agreeable to, I mean, it's how it's operated for, I don't know how many years, a gentleman's agreement, even though I'm a gentlewoman, um, that they'll come out and do the pump um, this one day because Ernest has... Um, agreed to pay for and it's not everything they're going to do and it might be an agreement and maybe we'll have to pay a small amount but he has at least agreed to share the cost of share or pay for the cost of getting the water off his property i don't want his property to have any more damage um, we've operated in a sort of um, goodwill agreements in the past and so I, if my fellow board supervisors kind of agree with that, let's get the water off his and um, Kathy's property, or if she so agrees, because they took the time to come to talk to us and because that's the way we operated in the past. Okay. And, and so if I understand what you're saying is, uh, uh, shall we put a $2,000 number on it? And uh, if Ernest agrees that he'll pay 
what it, the real cost. I mean, it might be more, and mm -hmm. but it won't be more than two thousand, and he'll pay the real cost. Um, but we can get the, and I don't know if it fits into the work plan, but if that works. Let me um, put some context for everybody is that I'm a consultant by background. I deal in real numbers and real costs. I'm sorry. Okay. In actuality, if I look at Bill's labor rate and I look at your equipment usage and I look at all the costs associated with it, that's the number I'm looking for. Yeah. This is business. So I'm going to look at the real cost that actually costs to provide me with that necessary relief. Just to say, and let, look, and let me be totally authentic, you say it won't go beyond $2,000. may cost $500. Well, like that, right? well, the way that I just want to clarify, the way Val put it, it would not exceed a certain amount. I'm not giving you that flexibility. I want a hard dollar cost. I'm a consultant. I deal with contracts every single day. If I'm paying you for relief to protect my property, I want a real number. I want real costs. I want real labor rates. Uh, and, and we can... We can put an estimate together and we can provide that to you. That's gonna take a little bit of time, which is gonna delay the process of how quickly we can get the pumps out there because it would not be to um, anyone's benefit to put that out there, pump it after I, as executive director and reporting to this board, I cannot be put in a position of doing work without a contract in place. And so it's gonna take a little time to get that cost estimate. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Ernest, the, the alternative is if you, if you don't want, if you're asking for a lot, and I think Mary Helen was trying to give you a quick- um, no, and, and, and you know what, I do appreciate that. She's trying to find a reasonable solution and I understand sure. I appreciate that. So I'm not discounting what she says, but uh, Han, I'm just not writing a blank check either. I, I totally agree. And, and, and you know, you, you don't have to use the pump from us either. You can also go and rent your own pump elsewhere mm -hmm. and have to and, and go through that process as well. So, so if you're going to want a hard number, we're going to be giving you a contract. It's going to take some time to draw up. And that's totally fine. And that contract should state the duration of it, the, whether the pump's going to stay there all the rest of the winter or not. Okay, thank you for uh, bringing your concerns to us. Uh, wait, wait, I'm not. Um, okay, so you guys have been talking, um, but here's my thing. So pen two, so if you're responsible, then are you going to agree that you guys were negligent and you guys no, we are not. The, tax, the, tax, the tax funds? You can't blame it on our two properties because that pipe has been broken for years. But and the fact break. that it's taken so long to even find out where the break has been is your guys' responsibility because you guys hire the third-party contractor. So it should have been up to pen two. It's your responsibility once you guys were informed that the water wasn't going down and something was broken with that pump station. It should have been your guys' responsibility to go and seek out what the problem is Instead of sitting here, oh, we've used over $10,000. Well, that's not my fault. I have an expectation of that pump to work. And if you guys didn't seek any, how, anything to fix it, then that's really your responsibility and your negligence. And now it's going on to my property. So because of the negligence of the pump, my property is being affected. Now, last year, you guys didn't hear a peep from me because I maintained as much as I could that water because I knew that the pumps weren't going in. But you didn't hear a peep from me. This year, the only reason you heard from me is because it went above my sandbag levels. I have tried every effort that I can to protect my property. But if that pump's not going to be in working order, then you guys need to take some responsibility. And must, because that's not fair to me. Because every time I come up with a solution, I'm being told, well, we don't know if we can do that. Well, we don't know if we can do that. Well, you know what? It's time for the, uh, we don't know, and we need to investigate how best to do this. We can no longer continue, you know, getting different answers or, you know, well, we don't know, because it is your responsibility to know. If We're talking to you one answer, and that answer is no. 
we are not responsible. For the if, pump? For so right. the, the pump. responsibility. What's that? So the pump on 13th is not your responsibility. Where the brake is, is not your responsibility. When, when we put a temporary pump out there, we're responsible for it being there. We are not responsible to always put it there. Uh, no, I, agree. I understand that. I understand what you're saying about that. But whose responsibility is the 13th station pump? I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Which What pump are you talking about? The pipe where it's broken. Because I, I understand that our water should flow to this pipe and go to the 13th um, Street station. The, the 13th Street pump being mentioned there is down by the slough on uh, adjacent to the Fazio property on, on the bank of the slough. Correct. That, that's the pump to go. We are responsible for that. We keep that going. All water that flows to that pump gets pumped into the slough, and that is our responsibility. Okay, but who, whose responsibility is the pipe that is broken? That yeah. is CES. That's Bureau of Environmental Services with the city of Portland. And, that, and we have worked with them to make sure that they they have it on their um, capital plan. And as Bill indicated um, early in our conversation that they plan to initiate that work in the fall, is it Bill? They're doing that, they're doing some of the design work now. That's correct. That's correct. It is, the pipe is in the public right of way. It is the city's responsibility. Uh, and I apologize for using the term fast track previously. Uh, that was uh, that was not the right application of it. Um, and uh, just for the matter of record, uh, during that time when the temporary pump was out uh, in those three years, um, Penn 2 did pay for um, alternatives uh, analysis to, to look at options, how to drain the water uh, besides that, that pipe in, in the right of way. Uh, and we also paid for inspection of that pipe um, uh, on, uh, and, and gave all that information to the city um, for them to act. Uh, and eventually they acted, um, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't until two, January 2020. So it's not the answer you want to hear, Kathy, I'm sure. Um, but I think you were correct before that other than, I guess, waiting for the Bureau of Environmental Services to fix that pipe, your only other option is to fill your property. In that, I, I, I think uh, Ernest and I can agree that might be the best solution because trying to work with Penn 2 and everybody else has been ridiculous because the city of Portland is telling me something completely different. And at this point, I think I need to look for other alternatives because I, I don't think it's my responsibility to sit here and play this wait and see game and have my property damaged because my concrete is now cracked because of all the water pressure. And I think that's garbage because nobody has ever been fully responsible in saying, hey, this is how it works. I mean, this is the most I've heard ever that oh, it's the city of Portland, that it's this, it's that. And I think it's, um, I think that the fact that had it been known when those first analyses were done saying it belongs to the city, I think Ernest and I would have been on the city's butt to get that repaired quickly. Can I ask you a question? Where water flows. When you say the city, that's a really broad term. Um, could you tell us, or would you be willing to tell us who you talk to? I have a number of contacts within BES and BDS um, who would. Yeah, I don't know what departments, but, but we. And I've never heard the this before. Land use. I'm, I'm sorry, you don't know. I don't know what departments they are, but I've talked to the city of land use, the Portland city land use. Okay, department. that's the Bureau of Development Services. Yeah, um, and so that's who I've talked to, but I'm a little frustrated because you're telling me that it's coming out of the BS. Or BES, it's Bureau yes. of Environmental Services, correct. Okay. So, and this is the first I've heard from you, um, and I'm trying to address your concerns because I've, Shared those concerns. But my, but is, my concerns are not being addressed because now I have to panic and probably rehome my animals because I know the water is going to go up high. Just in 24 hours, yesterday when it was semi dry, um, 
I had a little pool and I wasn't complaining about that. It was semi-dry and not nearing the kennels. Today I go out there and I've got puddles again. And that's just in a 24 hour. And mind you, it's probably a minuscule rain average, but it affects my property. And apparently it takes 24 hours for that water to settle. So when I go out at 7.30 at night tonight, it's gonna be a little bit higher. So yeah, I'm panicking and no, it's not addressing me. It's not helping me because I'm stuck in a situation where everybody's throwing their hands up and now I've got to figure it out in the well, middle of the rain season. I, 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 but I already have a sandbag line. They already gave me sandbags. So now I've got to put them up an extra foot because I'm afraid that it'll get to my animals. I'm sorry that you don't feel like we're helping you because I'm I think we're all taking the extra time of our day to help this. This is the first I've ever heard from you directly about your concerns. This is the first I've ever met you. You say you've come on Philoma, and the only person that actually came to my house was Val. And this was a two, three years ago when we first started this conversation. Have and you he's the a... only one that came to my property and talked to us. So for you to say that you've come out, I've been here seven years. Okay. I've never heard of you. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't want to get accusatory. So let's try to solve the problem. You have water issues um, and we're trying to address how best those can happen within the ramifications and guidelines that we've been entrusted by the landowners in Pen2. Um, we've done it with a number of other uh, neighbors and helped them with issues. I, um, I think that you need to do what's best for you in immediate terms. And if that's uh, frustrating to deal with the city, I, I the, the city is full of bureaucracy and everybody that's ever been in a meeting with me knows that. So I, I, I don't, I wanna be able to help you. And however that is, if it's giving you more sandbags, if it's um, finding you contractors that can help with pumping, uh, if MCDD cannot respond because of the high workload that they have, um, I think that's something that we need. I hear a dog. Is that one of your dog? No. Yeah, one sorry. of your puppies? No, no. Yeah. I I enjoy Zoom meetings because we get to see kids and we get to see people cooking and we get to see pets. Um, so I I, I don't want to create more work, but I think if you can work out some sort of resolution that would work best for you, um, you should should do that. And if it's including MCDD and it's within their ability of a workload um, or another contractor, um, Ernest said he was a consultant. Maybe he knows contractors out there that can help, but it, any homeowner coming to us, um, but all prior history of this was agreements. I can't tell you who I talked to in the houses and that was uh, five years ago, um, uh, Barbara Kerr also lives on Philoma. She's on the neighborhood board. Um, maybe the neighborhood um, board can have some advice for you of how that happens. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I just want you to not be angry with us for not trying to help you because I, I feel like we have. And I'm sorry that you feel like we haven't. Well, I guess here's the bottom line is, and, and essentially Val has um, stated it, you know, as well as Karen is, the bottom line is, is that uh, PIN2 or MCDD is not putting any additional resources into protecting neighbors' properties from flooding as a result of the slough that runs down the back of our property. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. That's the long and the short of it. There's no more resources coming in for Pen2. There's no I'm more. Sure of it. That's good. And and if you uh, reach agreement with the uh, support staff that Pen2 hires at MCDD to bring out a temporary pump, that's no doubt going to help Kathy as well. I, I just want to correct one part of your statement. You called it the SLU, and it's not the Columbia SLU. I don't know the definitions of a SLU, um, I mean, but I understand it's a moving waterway. Yeah, moving waterway, creek, however you want to phrase it. Yeah, no, but I, I don't want to get Columbia Slew in this because that's a whole nother uh, environmental concern. Those are mine. Those are mine. Well, I, I, it seems to me we have, uh, uh, we, 
we have resolved this issue with Ernest and uh, Bill uh, and or, uh, or Peggy uh, negotiating an agreement uh, to get a temporary pump out there for a short period of time to get that water level down. That will no doubt also help Kathy. And uh, now you know that uh, you should be beating on the door of the Bureau of Environmental Services to see if they will accelerate their repair to that, that pipe. Well, I mean, just to be clear, Val, I mean, it, it's not a resolved issue. It's a, it's a property owner trying to protect his, his investment. The resolved issue would be if there was a partnership between Pen2 and the homeowners, but there is not. I am paying for yes, service. You're, you're absolutely right there. We have the same situation over here on Meadow where the homeowners will not agree that there's a drainage ditch behind their properties. They will not give us permission to keep that ditch clear. So yes, it takes agreement of the property owners. Absolutely. But I think what Ernest is also saying is nobody's ever asked us for permission or to say, hey, we're gonna have to sit down because this is the overall, overall um, what's happening. Because I would never deny access to MCDD because they've been on my property numerous amount of times every year. So um, I would never deny them access. So to you, you know, to say, oh, well, you don't have permission. You guys have always had permission from me. I have never said no. We need it from all your neighbors to make to turn that into a drainage. Um, I have okay. I have Ernest and the neighbors on the side, and both of them have been okay with you guys coming on the property. You guys have seen both sides of the property. I don't think either one of us, and we're the three that are impacted. To be honest, let's be honest here. My other neighbors aren't as impacted as us three here. Like I said, I am the lowest point, and everybody forgot about us and didn't really care enough to contact us um, and say, "Hey, this is what's going on." And I wish there would have been a little more preparation instead of we've helped you enough. Our arms are up in the air. It's you're on your own. Because like I said, now I've got to look for a solution in the middle of a rainy season and I'm not going to get any solution. I'm going to get water. Uh, Kathy, I think letters were sent out from the drainage district okay. to all the homeowners on those two streets concerning this property. And I, there's one more point I want to make to both you and Ernest. You keep saying, it's Pen 2's problem. Or, no, you are Pen 2. You are East Columbia Neighborhood Association. Every homeowner in this area is part of Peninsula Drainage District Number 2 and yeah, East but, Columbia Neighborhood Association. But we're not running things and we're not making the decisions. You have to come to the meetings. Yeah, we are ju we're just being told of what the decision is. Well, we're, and actually, I have to think about I mean, it. We're at a meeting right now. And if we're a part of, as you said, you know, Pen 2 is that we've actually just been told that Pen 2 is no longer willing to invest in providing you any relief. So the statement itself is kind of contradicted. We've not said that at all. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna, um, we've been trying to help you and we've been giving you options. Um, and, and you are not the only homeowners that have had issues with uh, water on your property. Um, I don't have the time to list you the numbers of people that we have um, dealt with, worked with, those that have come to landowners meetings and neighborhood meetings. So uh, I, I, again, I'm going to say I, I, I'm a little bit upset that you would think that we aren't trying to help you. We're just trying to tell you we've got the uh, determination that it is private property. So I, I can't go across the road to my neighbor's house and say, you need to do this and this and this. Um, and we're gonna, because I think you should. Um, it, it, it's his property and he has to take care of it. And I can only suggest. And the Pen2 board um, it does not own your property. And we've listened to your concerns. We've offered you an alternative. And I'm even more willing to meet with you at some point. I know that Karen and Bill have spent time out talking to people. I don't have exact names of people that I gave to you. Maybe Dave Hendricks had that in notes somewhere. Um, but to beat us over the head and say we didn't do anything, I, I think is a disservice 
Um, and I hope that you recognize that we're here to serve you. That's what the Pen2 board is. And that you will um, continue these talks with us because it might help in the future for other people on other streets. Like Val said, Meadow Lane, um, the, I'm more than willing to speak with the city and use, uh, use to my ability to find out who has spoken to you um, and what the property files are and see how we can't rectify that with the city. I don't know any of that. So, um, and I will be doing that in the next week. Uh, Let me ask you a quick question, Mayor Helen. Was there any conversations with the city of Portland to provide a pump or to provide you guys with resources? Did you ever make that request of the city? Did Penn too? Never had. And Bill, you want to answer that? I, I did. Uh, I, in this last uh, last go around, um, so the last storm that happened last uh, week, uh, I did connect with the city staff, particularly BES staff, um, and they were willing to provide uh, some equipment um, and signage, um, but um, their, their limited resources were trying to deal with the mudslides in Northwest and some other places as well. So they were so trying to- When you say equipment, do you mean they were willing to provide you with a pump? Uh, I, they didn't offer it and I didn't ask. But I mean, you, you, sort, you sort of make my point, Bill, is, is that it's about a partnership. So if, if you guys have limited resources, then why not make the ask? So that lifts the burden off of pin two, right? Why don't you make that request, Ernest? Yeah, it, it's your property. So I don't think that pen two is in a position to call and say to the city, will you put a pump out here and put it on his property? Yes. Um, it's agreement that it, I, 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 I'll use shoveling snow. You can go out and shovel the snow of your neighbor and somebody slips and fall, your neighbor can blame you because you shoveled the snow. Yeah. Um, what, I, I think what you need to do is find the resources that you need to take care of your property. Um, you we're willing to help. And if that we can be a part of that, we certainly will. Well, you, I mean, again, you contradict yourself. In one minute you're saying, hey, call the city yourself. And then the other thing you say is, I hope we can be a part of that conversation. I mean, which is it? Bill was already on the phone with the city. My question to Bill is that if you're already on the phone with the city and they already said they will willing to provide the resources and where they can offset what you're currently doing, why not make the ask? On one hand, you talk about partnership, but on the other hand, you talk about you're on your own. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Well, I mean, you can't ask for something. I can't call and ask the city to send, even I as a citizen, even Kathy as your neighbor. I mean, even though you have a similar uh, issue, MCDD cannot, or Pen2 cannot call the city and say, hey, go put a pump out here for these people. It's not their property and it's not their responsibility. Wait a minute. Can Bill, I wait, let me finish the statement. Bill just told you that he was on the phone with the city and they offered some reason. No. Well, not exactly true. No. Well, well, let Bill clarify his statement then. So last week um, I did have, I was on the phone with the city staff and um, we were brainstorming about what could be, what we can do in response. We knew that we had a pump that uh, we thought could, um, we could, it could do the job. And, but we didn't have other resources uh, at the time, I didn't think at least. Um, and so we were talking about signage and, and a couple other miscellaneous things they were able to, um, they said, yes, you can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dig around, see if we can put some signs up and you can come by if you need them. So they were willing to provide some material that we asked for specifically. Um, and since, um, since the water's pumped down, I've had continued to have conversations with the city uh, and even with a scenario to say, look, if the water rises again, um, I think uh, since Pen2 has already done this once, I would like to ask the city staff and their equipment to come out and pump it down um, and other scenarios like that. So I have connected with the city. I've asked for very specific things at the time, given the information I had. And since then, um, I've continued to connect with them and, and will continue to do so. So in that time, maybe the city could be a partner that could step in 
and do some of the things that Pen2 doesn't have the resources to do. Would that be, would that be a fair statement, Bill? Yeah, I certainly hope so. I don't know what all the equipment they have there. They're a big city, so I presume they have a small pump well, and like know. this. Yeah, and they have hose. And so I just presume they have it. I don't know for sure though. Um, and um, as Mary Ellen said, uh, I can't just direct them to do it, well, but okay. uh, I can ask them uh, as a partner with us to say, look, we've done it. Um, with, there's, a, there's a period here where we need to try to keep the water down and um, over this next nine months. And uh, we've already, we've, we've done some work this last time. Can you help us out? Uh, can you help out the same property owners um, uh, moving forward until the pipe is fixed? So, so those conversations are happening. Can you make the ask, Bill? I'm sorry, sir? Can you make the ask of the city? Yes, we've, I've, I've asked the city once informally and we've already um, agreed to meet to, with different, the right people in the room to, uh, to make that formal request. Okay, do you know when that formal request would take place? I don't yet. Uh, I can work with Codrin to, uh, uh, to keep you in the loop though. Okay. So, and, we, and we have to remember also, my concern is recognizing, I mean, because we work closely with the city on many, many, many issues. And many times they have other priorities as well. So it's where we fit into their priorities list as well. Not saying this isn't a priority. I'm just, I want to manage expectations of where, what the city may or may not be able to do. I think the, the other thing, the other thing I'd like to make a statement of, which I'd heard from Mary Helen earlier in this conversation, and um, I kind of looked at this as a two-step, I may be oversimplifying, but a two-step process. One we have, a st and one is very short-term and taking care of the immediate needs, which I think we have a, a viable solution. But what I'm also hearing is there are concerns on a more long-term basis. And I would ask the board that, that staff can come forward to the board with potential strategies to, to talk about this, if this is, um, but what I did hear from Mary Helen is it really needs to be raised by that neighborhood association um, as an issue, but I, the, those are those are longer term solutions that we're certainly not going to get resolved today. Yeah, and you know, I, I would I would conclude in in saying this is this is more specific to Bill. You know, it's just like my grandfather used to tell me, nothing beats a failure but a try. And the only thing I'm really asking at the end of the day is for Bill to ask the question of the city. There's one of two things that are going to happen. The city is going to say yes, Bill, we'll help you, or no, Bill, we can't. That's correct. We won't know until at least he makes the request. I think we've got a, a good action plan there, and I liked your word, the conclusion, Ernest. Um, the uh, all of us can be all of us can be reached at uh, mcdd.org. There's a tabs where you can uh, email people. Uh, if you know our names, uh, the uh, email addresses there are going to be our first initial or our last name at mcdd.org. So if you want to continue this discussion with individuals or whatever, you can get our email uh, contacts at the, that website. But and I also want to add to that, Val, if you go to the um, East Columbia neighborhood, you'll get the list of the board members. And I strongly suggest involving them because they're going to have more uh, impact and can work involvement with uh, Karen on how um, we can make this be a neighborhood issue and not just site specific or people that live on waterways. Yeah. And I, I apologize, but I have to go because I have somebody waiting that I have to take to the doctor. So Ernest, thank you very much for coming. I will follow up with uh, the contact information that our board president just shared. So the emails to the individual board members, as well as um, East Columbia Neighborhood Association links. Um, and as I mentioned before, some of this information is, is on the website. What I would, um, what I would add is, um, based on what's been discussed here, we welcome your feedback. Um, so we have attempted to do communications. We've mailed letters. We've delivered public notices to invite you to come to the meetings when these conversations were being had a, 
couple of years ago. Um, and I understand, you know, we understand, you know, that form of communications may not be sufficient. So um, if there's additional communications that you would like to receive beyond, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, which we've had over the last two weeks, but there's different mailing addresses that we need to be considering to send letters to. Anything like that will help us make sure that you're getting the communications in a timely fashion. Um, so, so I can definitely follow up with the both of you and think about ways in which we can make sure you're getting this information um, consistently. Well, at this point, I don't even think I need the information if I'm being told that it's my property and I can do whatever I want. You know, as long as I go through the logistics and go the legal route, I don't, I don't think I need to have any access to PenQ or anything. Because once I fill in my property, I don't, I don't need to interact with them. I mean, this is frustrating because I have no solution now, except I have to get rid of my animals and protect my property. And Kathy, um, to Ernest, your, you, your point earlier about technical assistance, which is what had been offered as, as part of the, the letter communication. So there was technical assistance that was offered and then the opportunity to access sandbag materials um, to create protective barriers. And, and so I've done on, that. On that note, I think, Kathy, we, we can reattempt to schedule a meeting and with Bill and um, you know, on your property. And there's definitely contacts that the district can help to provide as far as, you know, additional contractors you can consider to make improvements on your property. So we okay, can- but Like I said, it's now my responsibility. So at this point, there's nothing that I need from MCDD or Pen2 because- Okay, Kathy, you can you be doing any contact that Kareem makes with you, but Kareem, please go ahead and make that contact. Thank you. I think what's critical at, at this point, uh, just to recap, is PIN2, as a result of the flooding on people's property, uh, as a result of the investment that they've actually made, has no further uh, responsibilities in providing any relief. That's a board decision, and that's fine. What is critical is the conversation that Bill is having with the city to see if, in fact, the city can bring in the necessary equipment since PIN2 is not going to provide the necessary equipment. So I do want to uh, know when those communication bills are actually taking place with the city and the progress with the city and providing uh, the relief of the neighborhood and draining that water. So that really is what's, what's most critical at this point is how those conversations are going, what equipment they can provide, and what support they can actually give PIN2 in relieving the water issue. So if you can keep me in the loop when those conversations are taking place, because the city is going to say one of two things. They're either going to say, yes, we're going to help, or no, we're not. And Bill will do that, correct? Okay. Uh, I believe we need to consider this agenda item finished. We do have one more item on the agenda I'd like to take up. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we're not going to make our neighbors happy. I understand why they're not. I wouldn't be happy with the water on my property either. But I'm afraid that's uh, all we can do with this today. The other item on the agenda is the- Can I uh, say one more thing before you cut us off and just like throw us away? Bill, is there any chance that you can send me the information about the BES and who, um, what, you know, all the department information so we, maybe Ernest and I can start uh, tag teaming and talking to them and seeing, I mean, I, I agree with Ernest and I would well, appreciate I, you I, guys. I, I, Bill can do that, is that correct? I, I certainly can do that through and with Connor's help. Yes. Um, okay. And Bill and Karen, I really appreciate your help. Thank you very much. Do you have, do you have Kathy's email address, Bill? Okay. Yes, I have their contact information. And okay. Ernest, uh, just Debbie Castleton is the, the first contact I would recommend. So I'll reshare that information right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on now to the consideration of filling the vacant uh, supervisor position. Have uh, has everyone on the board seen the uh, presentation or the email uh, uh, int uh, statements of interest from Eric Molander and uh, Kathy Kellen? Yes. And yes. Uh, I believe Emily, you uh, you asked them whether those statements uh, could be considered their 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 presentation as about uh, their candidacy. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I let them know it was optional for them to attend the meeting if they couldn't. So, and yeah, that you would be discussing it. I don't see them on, on <laughs> but they're not here, right? Correct. Okay. So, if everybody's read that and has an opinion, does, does anybody make the, we, we should consider them both candidates, both nominated. Um, does, uh, does anyone have any discussion they want to make? Yeah, are those paid or non-paid positions? Non-paid. And, and, and that's another point. Uh, come to the next uh, meeting and uh, vote us out of office and take over these jobs. Uh, Karen, did you, did you have your hand raised? You wanted to say something? Or that no. was it? You were just gesturing. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I have a comment. Um, I think we're lucky to have two really, really good con can uh, candidates. Um, Eric has a lot of business expense and financial uh, analysis skills. Um, and Kathy Cullen as the director of Columbia Sioux Watershed Council has the experience in natural environment, uh, waterways, building coalitions. She works with uh, a wide variety of um, BIPOC groups. Um, they have a reach over the city. They've been involved in the neighborhood with uh, SLU uh, improvements and Probably, I, you know, in light of the previous conversation, would be an excellent resource in this in how best to handle waterways. Um, and so I, I am um, recommending that we select Kathy because we lost that expertise when Jennifer Devlin left the board. Uh, Val and Karen both have financial and um, expertise, I think, as well as Leslie in a business sense but we don't have a true environmental um, person. And going forward with the new urban flood safety water quality district, that's gonna be a di a, an issue in the uh, defining of um, how we address those needs. And uh, that's just sort of my comment. Uh, I, I think either are good candidates, but I think to, as opposed to representing groups of people or specific audiences, this gives us a representation of a skill that we're really gonna need as we go forward. Thank you, Mary Helen. Anybody else wish to make a comment? I agree that both of them are good candidates and Eric's already involved in a couple of the different committees, whereas, is it Kathy, is not. And I think that getting her involved would be a good thing. She is. Um on uh, interim, the interim flood safety water quality, same as Eric and I am as well. And, uh, but her concept of the SLU and history, I think- She's not on the- No, which one is it? Kathy's not on the urban flood safety. Is it the IGA one? I don't know, I got them all confused. Yeah, I think she's on the LRC, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, okay. Sorry. Do you want to say anything? Karen, do you, do you have anything you want to oh, say? Oh, I'm sorry, Val. I was having a little nap here. No. I, <laughs> okay, let's say. I, then, I think I agree with Mary Helen, though. I think Kathy would be a good addition. It sounds like we're pretty much in agreement. Uh, let's take the two candidates in order or in, in the order of suggestion there. Uh, all in favor of uh, appointing, I guess we're appointing, aren't we? Because uh, it's a vacancy. Kathy Kellen to the position, I think it's position one, but whatever it is, the vacant position on the board, say, uh, well, vote, let's vote by roll call. Uh, uh, Karen, you're senior. I vote aye. <laughs> Mary Helen. I'm second senior, aye. Val Humble <laughs> votes aye. Leslie Sire. Aye. So uh, I guess all votes were for uh, uh, Kathy instead of uh, Eric. Um, Mary or Emily, would you uh, notify Kathy that the uh, board has appointed her to the vacant position? Yes, I'll get all her paperwork in order so she can get sworn in at the next meeting. You have to be sworn in and all that stuff. You'll take care of that, right? Yes. And, and you'll also notify Eric of our decision. Yes, yes, please. Is, is there anything else this board should deal with before we adjourn? Um, I, I see Ernest is still on the call and I just hope that you keep in contact with us because I'm really excited that um, you are 
and we have not had um, any participation of substance at any of our landowners meetings, our annual landowners meeting. I think um, your input and your um, wisdom could inform us as we go forward because the four drainage districts will be merging into a special district and your concerns need to be addressed of how we serve those people that um, have operated pretty much in my opinion on you know word of mouth and um, I, I think Kathy was pretty upset with the resolution but it, it's um, this helps us define what it is that we are and who we represent. So thank you very much for taking all the time today to be in this meeting. No, I, I, uh, I appreciate the time uh, and the flexibility that you guys have given me um, to actually talk about this issue and sort of vet it out, you know, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, it takes partnerships. You know, it's, it's not about the money that you spend. You know, it's about the partnerships that you, you build in the communities in which you serve. And at the end of the day, some neighbors may need more attention than others. Some neighbors may need less attention than others. But it's how you build partnerships throughout that community is the value proposition. And everybody who's on this board is on this board to serve, right? They're not on this board to piss people off. They're not on this board to tell people no. They're on this board to serve. So the only thing that I would say is just keep the eyes on the prize, which is building community partnerships. You know, I got like two kids and, get, and at times I give one kid more attention than the other. But at the end of the day, it all balances out. So that's the only thing that I would say is that as you guys move forward, continue the work that you're doing, but just keep that in mind. No, I, I agree because I've been on enough um, public engagement kinds of adventures and I know full well that you can't make all of the people happy all of the time. But if everybody at least... Um, it has a chance to state their opinion and become involved. That's the important part. And that's by forming these partnerships that, that help us make where we live better. And so I think your involvement is going to benefit the neighborhood. That's why I encourage you to get a hold of the Neighborhood Association. So thank you. Thank you. I, got, I only got one final question. Do I get everybody's cell phone numbers? I don't have a cell phone. If you don't get Val's in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never, I never, <laughs> I really, I, I could tell you this right now. I have a cell phone, but I'm hard pressed to tell you where it is. And the battery's probably dead somewhere, <laughs> but um, I am more than happy if Emily or whoever it is shares our email contact information. Um, wow. And I, I I can give you my landline number if you want that. I don't mind, but um, I, I wear hearing aids and cell phones don't work well with hearing aids. No, I appreciate that. But I was just uh, just teasing a little bit. But, you know, again, uh, it takes conversation and it takes partnership. And as long as the goal always is to drive toward a solution, you can always find a solution. You know, the solution is always pretty, but, you know, that's the goal. Ernest, for official communications, uh, email is best because it makes the uh, it creates a documented mm -hmm. record that's a part of the public record. So if you go to our uh, mcdd.org email addresses, that's the best way to establish a documented public record. If you want to call me up and say your water's high, I'm 503-289-9382 landline. Well, I appreciate that, Val. But uh, like I said, uh, I know that we were way over the time intended. Uh, so I appreciate everybody's willingness to engage in the conversation because I know everybody's past the time they normally would have spent on this call. So I appreciate the time and I appreciate the flexibility. Thank you for showing up. Thanks, Ernest. And Ken is now officially adjourned. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah for yesterday. <laughs> Hallelujah for today. Thank you.